Sonnenschein Mensch ist. Drum braucht er was zum Essen, bitte sehr. Es macht ihn ein Geschwätz nicht satt, das schafft kein Essen her. Weil der Mensch ein Mensch ist, drum hat der Stiefel im Gesicht nicht gern. Er will unter sich keinen Sklaven sehen und über sich keinen Herrn. Drum ist zwei, drei, drum ist zwei, drei, und ein Platz. Der Prolet ein Prolet ist, drum wird ihn kein anderer befreien. Es kann die Befreiung der Arbeiter nur das Werk der Arbeiter sein. Drum ist zwei, drei, drum ist zwei, drei, und ein Platz. Zdrastwitja, comrades, welcome to another edition of Socialism Saturday. Socialism Saturday is when we, you know, relax, kick up our feet, drive ourselves mad by watching the real socialists, the farthest of the far left, the most dystopian of the dystopian. And we watch them and listen to them in their long form, their full presentations, the trainings they give to each other, the podcasts, the talks, the lectures, the whole nine. And we listen to them in their natural environment because that's when they say the quiet part out loud. That's when they say the things that they don't think we're listening to. And that is when they reveal exactly and precisely what they're doing. And the reason that we watch Socialism Saturday is that we have found consistently over the course of doing this for, I mean, almost, we're, we're, we're about to come up on a full year of Socialism Saturday. We've been doing this for a while now. And uh, what we traditionally find is that if we go back and we watch socialist presentations from like three, four, five years ago, those are the same talking points that the Democratic Party is using today. So Socialism Saturday is like your preview into where all of this is going and it takes your understanding of the woke left ideology that you see infiltrating all our institutions. It takes your understanding of what is going on to a completely new level. I firmly believe that people who watch Socialism Saturday combined with happy hours that we do on Fridays, you guys know more about what the woke left is doing than anyone else on the internet. You know more than the journalists, the journalists. You know more than the pundits. You know more than the commentators. You know more than the so-called experts. I really do believe that my audience, and this is not to pat myself on the back because we all sit here and we do this every single week. I firmly believe that my audience is the most educated audience on the internet about what is actually going on. Because we sit our butts down, we shut our mouths, we stop looking for gotcha moments, and we listen to them from start to finish in their true form. And we do this to understand their perspective understand what they believe, understand where they're going, understand what they're doing. We're not looking for gotcha moments. We're not calling out all the things that are stupid. Okay, we do call out some of the things that are stupid, but we do it to understand what they're doing. And this is something that people are just not inclined to do. Well, today, guys, if you are new to Socialism Saturday, and welcome back, Kino. If you guys are new to Socialism Saturday, this is actually going to be a really great evening 
for people who are relatively new to socialism and probably a nice little refresher course for those of us who have been watching this since the very beginning. You know, a couple of weeks ago, we did a full three part course on how to be the very best comrades that we can be. And I actually thought that that was a really insightful training about who these people are and what they believe. But I've got something I think might that might be even better today. Because we have some new friends on Socialism Saturday. We made these new friends, what, like three weeks ago? Three, four weeks ago, something like that. We made friends with a channel called Midwestern Marks. And, you know, they were a little upset at us because we watched a book launch that they did about the purity trap, which basically said that we really need to appeal to working class people on the right and we need to reach out to them. And I was like, this is perfect. I have working class people on the right. You guys want to appeal to working class people on the right. Like this is a match made in heaven. Well, it turns out that Midwestern Marx was not too impressed with the fact that we that we uh, that we meta streamed their book launch and we talked about it live as it was happening and apparently and I even I even sent Midwestern Marks a really nice follow up email and I said listen I know we may not have gotten off on the right foot but you said in your training that you want to appeal to like working class Trump people. I have working class Trump people on my channel. Do you want to come on and and pitch your ideas and talk to them about why socialism is the best way that they should go? And they never answered my email. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I thought that this was just they did this whole like hours long book launch about how how they really needed to appeal to to this type of, of proletarian. And. I gave them the opportunity to, and they never answered the email. Can you imagine that? Can you believe it? It's almost like Midwestern Marx doesn't believe any of the things that they're saying. I know, Jan, I, I thought so too. How rude. How rude and inconsiderate. But I was looking at Midwestern Marx's uh, YouTube channel today, and just four days ago, they did a three hour class about the basics of Marxism. And even though it says class number two, the description says this is the first content class of the Midwestern Marx Institute basics of Marxism course. And I thought we want to learn about Marxism. We want to know what your perspective is. What better way to learn from our new friends over at Midwestern Marks than to watch their full three hour class on the basis of basics of Marxism? So this is going to be a perfect time. This is going to be a perfect stream for anyone who's new to Socialism Saturday, anyone who maybe needs to be brought up to speed. Listen, guys, one of the challenges of socialism and watching socialism is that there is a bit of a learning curve. When we do happy hours on Fridays at five, that's like kind of our standard level class. Like anyone can come to happy hour and pretty much understand what's being said. Socialism Saturday is like our advanced AP class where there is a little bit of a learning curve. And I just want to like, you know, remind people if you're still new to socialism and you still feel like you don't understand what they're saying at all, that's normal because socialists speaking code they they change the definitions of words they might it might sound like english but it's not english it's a weird socialist like it's a weird socialist bastard bastardization of english where they they take 87 words to say something that they could say in three words quite effectively like they change the definitions of things they change the meanings of things sometimes we have to listen really closely to find out exactly what they're saying because we can only tell what their definitions are based on the context of their words over time you start to learn socialism okay i've been i've been immersing myself in socialism for nine straight months now i have learned through osmosis how to speak socialism as have many of the people who have been around for a while. And and Trendlin, I was actually just working on a dictionary earlier today. I, I, I have this in progress. Don't worry. 
And so, guys, that is what we are going to do today is we are going to watch the three hour Midwestern Marx class on the basics of Marxism. And so hopefully everyone can be brought up to speed and it'll be a nice little introductory course for all of us. It's going to be great. Now, we do have a couple orders of business before we get started with our class. And and by the way, too, I wanted to mention, I spent some time just perusing Midwestern Marx's website today. And can I just show you guys, if I didn't know that this was like a real thing, I don't think I would take this seriously. Like, they're serious about this. They really are social. They're Marxists. They they really, really are. But, like, I really don't think I would have taken... I, I would have thought that this website was, like, a parody if I had just stumbled on it without knowing who these people are because it's just so on the nose of, like, look at this. They have the Midwestern Marx Youth League. Like, this is something that they think is, like, a good thing. This is something they think is positive. Like they've got like all it, it is. It is a bizarre website to kind of cruise around, if I'm honest. And especially knowing that this is not a joke. This is not a prank. Like they actually idolize people like like Lenin and Mao. Like I mean, it, it really it, it it is crazy. And these are these are like these are like white boys from the United States. I I don't understand it at all. Um. But there are a lot of resources on there that we might avail ourselves of. There are like reading lists. There are there are PDF downloads. There are videos. There are so many things. And um, and so we might avail ourselves of some more Midwestern Marx content in the future. But this is where we're going to start today. Now, of course, I would not leave you guys hanging without socialism bingo. Because, of course, we have to keep ourselves occupied somehow. Here is the uh, the socialism bingo card in the chat. I'll also pop it in the chat over on um, Rumble because I know I've had uh, some more folks watching on Rumble lately, which I think is great. And I'll pop the chat out on Rumble so I can see it on the screen at the same time. So if Rumble wants to chat in, that's great too. And uh, with your socialism bingo card, just click generate card. There's a free square in the middle. If you're lucky, you get solidarity twice due to equity. Not because I screwed up making the bingo card. And then we go for lines or we go for corners. If you get a bingo in the chat, please go ahead and shout that out. You won't win anything because this is socialism. You don't get anything via socialism. But we will give you a hearty round of applause and celebrate you for being the best comrade that you can be. And uh, then once we get normal bingo, we are going for blackout bingo after that. And I've got high hopes today with Midwestern Marx because this is a three-hour intro class to all things Marxism. So we really may fill up our entire bingo card which i think should always be the goal and what we're striving for so that's in the chat right now of course i just want to remind everyone to please make sure you are subscribed to my Substack, which is carlin k-a-r-l-y-n dot substack.com of course i do have a whole bunch of Substacks, but this is my main Substack. it's the one where i do do premium content and most importantly it is the one where i will be sending out the supporter perks tomorrow in the weekly email that goes out. So I do a weekly email every week. It's going to look a lot like this. It's called the Unwoke Roundup. And you want to make sure that that if you are a supporter on the channel, you want to make sure you check this email because down at the very bottom of the email, scroll past all the stuff, you're going to find your supporter perks. That includes two Zoom calls every single week on Mondays and Wednesdays with me and the rest of my supporter community. They're private. They are unrecorded. They are awesome. It includes access to the supporter discord. There is a writer's group for creatives on Thursday nights in the supporter discord that I definitely recommend everyone avail themselves of. And tomorrow night on Sundays, we're doing movie night. Now, tomorrow we will either be watching Logan's Run or Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I don't know which one yet because there's a poll going in the locals. Jennifer is handling it. But it will either be Logan's Run or Invasion of the Body Snatchers, both amazing movies. And so we do do movie night every single Sunday in the supporter discord at 8 p.m. Eastern time. And your access to the supporter discord will be in the weekly perks section of the Substack If that is where you are a supporter on, if you are a supporter on locals, I will be posting it in locals. If you are a supporter on Patreon, I will be support posting it in Patreon. If you are a member of this here YouTube channel, I will be posting it here. But, um, but I definitely am trying to push as many people as possible to become supporters on my Substack. 
be for five bucks a month, 50 bucks a year, because this is my content hub moving forward. And um, you guys keep me in business. You guys allow me to do what I'm doing. And I really do appreciate it. And last order of business for today, I just want to remind everyone that if you head over to unwokeart.com, which is my official merch store, you can get a couple things that are definitely related to Socialism Saturday to include the official Socialism Saturday Join the Cult t-shirt. If you want that, I know a couple of you have uh, gotten that item, but then we also have the B Bourgeois collection. And this is our direct middle finger to the socialists who don't want us to be bourgeois. The socialists want us to be proletarian. I don't want to be proletarian. I want, I like capitalism. I want to embrace capitalism. And so I made a special design for the Unwoke Art Store all about being bourgeois. You can get it on a sticker. You can get it on a poster. You can get it on a, a mug. You can get it on a t-shirt, on a hoodie. Let's just look at this here mug. Come on. It looks awesome. It's the Be Bourgeois Fox. Trendelin just got her Be Bourgeois sh uh, shirt. Thank you, Trendelin, for that. It's got this beautiful purple, the color of royalty, my favorite color. Foxes, of course, are basically my spirit animal. He's all dappered out in his capitalism suit. He's got his beer, of course. And so you can find the Be Bourgeois collection over on the, uh, the merch store, unwokeart.com. You can get all sorts of other stuff, too, including... The golden Trump is still available. I, I'm, I'm going to keep the golden Trump up through Father's Day. All right. So everyone will be able to get their golden Trump as a nice Father's Day present. A lot of people have bought this mug. I'm really happy about it. And, um, and, and I've seen the pictures. People are loving it. People are sending me pictures of their golden Trump. It came out so, so, so good. And um, so if you want to get yours, you still can. I'm going to keep it up until Father's Day. And, um, and that is when, um, it'll be taken down. I, I might keep the mug up. I don't know. I'm going to, I'm definitely going to take down other parts of the collection, but we might keep the mug up just because it's just, uh, it's just too good. There's lots of other stuff you can buy in the Unwoke Art Store if you're so inclined and, uh, you can peruse over there. And of course, all of the proceeds do go to support the work I'm doing. And I just have a great time making the merch. I just love it. It's like, I'm going to be honest, guys. It's not like, you know, it's doing well. I'm actually really surprised at how well the store is doing, but it's like, it costs money to produce the merchandise, so I'm not like rolling in the dough from this or anything. It definitely does help, but I just love being able to make the merchandise. I have so much fun with it, and um, I really appreciate you guys um, that are enjoying the merchandise um, on the uh, in the store. Do I ever take phone calls? I used to. I haven't in a while. Um, maybe I will again. Maybe. I don't know. Maybe. We'll see. Saw your video on conservative coverage of O'Keefe that helped put things in perspective. Well, thank you for that vision. Yeah, I was, uh, I had some feelings last night and, uh, I worked out my feelings on the internet, but we're not talking about that right now. Cause guys, it is time to get into our socialism three hour class on the basics of basis, base six. There we go of Marxism. Now I need everyone to go ahead and uh, mount that like button for me. You are not mounting the like button because you appreciate Marx. You are not mounting the like button for Midwestern Marx. You are mounting the like button to tell other people to come and join us on the stream because the more people who learn about socialism, the more people are going to be able to pick it up when it shows up in the real world, like at your kid's school with your kids teachers jackie is here for the first time welcome jackie don't be overwhelmed guys if you are here for the first time again i want to emphasize if you this is going to be a great class for beginners <clears throat> but if you have questions please ask them i will try to do my best to decode things autumn who is a socialist is running around in the chat you can ask autumn questions now don't be 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 skeptical of anything that autumn tells you because autumn is a socialist we do occasionally get other socialists in the chat on socialism saturday as a reminder the rules of my chat are as follows number one don't be a dick do not insult me do not insult other people in the chat number two no whining if i tell you to stop doing something stop doing it I don't want to hear whining. I don't want to hear complaining. I just want I just want whatever was going on to be stopped. That's it. Okay? So socialists are allowed to be here as long as they are not being disruptive and they're not being dicks. So take advantage of it. If this is our time to learn about socialism, take advantage of asking the socialists in the, quack, the chat questions and maybe they'll be good enough to answer with an honest answer 
Fox, you just bought a mug? Oh, thank you, Fox. I appreciate that. Beth, I know you're not whining. Beth is a perpetual queen of the chat, so Beth can do whatever she wants. Beth, thank you for the super chat. Have you made it all the way through the introduction of the book? Good heavens, it's arduous. I haven't. <laughs> I've been reading. Beth and I are reading Transgender Marxism together. I have been reading like two or three pages at a time. <laughs> I'm going to try to read some more tonight, I promise, but it is arduous. It is so much. It's like, oh, but you're doing the Lord's work, Beth, and I appreciate you, and you're definitely not whining. It's okay to whine about transgender Marxism. That's a whole other thing. All right, guys, let's get this party started. We are doing a three-hour Basics of Marxism course. Someone pray a rosary or something. Let's do it. Oh, hang on. I don't think I set this up right. Hang on, hang on, hang on. I already screwed up. I was I was already a capitalist and I already screwed up. Hang on, I got to set this up so you can actually hear the sound. There we go. There we go. Sin also does have the B Bourgeois mug and it turned out great. All right. For real this time. Hello everyone. And welcome to the Basics of Marxism School, our first course uh, being, or I'm sorry, <laughs> I already messed up the intro, look at me. Welcome to Marxism School, our first course of Basics of Marxism. I'm Noel Krajcevic, and we're going to get right to it after this. <laughs> Our music is definitely better, but I agree. Cheers, everyone. Welcome to the basics of Marxism. We had a fantastic first class last week. Unfortunately, we had a couple technical difficulties and we weren't able to live stream it. We ironed those out, though, and here we are just in time for our first content class where we're going to be going over an essay by William Z. Foster called The Major Principles of Marxist Socialism. Now, this essay is absolutely brilliant. What it does is it gives new people a view of the way Marxists speak and how we present this. Trendelin says, why, hang on, why did they have an MLK quote? Because MLK was kind of a socialist. He was, he was, he, he was like, listen, I'm not, I'm not going to besmirch MLK's memory or anything, but he was a socialist. <laughs> I mean, that doesn't mean like, like there were legitimate problems that he was trying to solve. And, and, and some of MLK's relatives even say that if he hadn't been assassinated, he totally would have embraced critical race theory. I don't think that that's true. I don't think that that actually aligns with things that he said when he was alive. Um, but, but he was, he was kind of like a, a socialist. It's, it's, it's true, but that should not besmirch his memory. All right. He did good things. And remember, back in the day, during the, the civil rights movement was like a necessary thing. Like, the, like the, the problem is like there were real problems in regards to race and, and, and then later with like gay rights in this country. And we shouldn't we shouldn't like, you know, we shouldn't deny that those problems happened. But MLK was a socialist. He was. 
things, how we think, how we look at the world, and how it's different from a lot of the misconceptions that we tend to see on the modern left. Uh, I just want to say a quick hello to everybody in the class, in the Zoom class. Um, Seriously, Vince. And with that, we're going to get started. I mean, unless there's any... Uh, I mean, it was the same with like, it was like, you know, I mean, it, like Jim Jim Jones, too, that the cult leader that, that brought people to like Guyana, like he, he like the Kool-Aid guy, like the drinking the Kool-Aid, the mass, like, you know, death guy. Um, Like, I mean, he was a socialist as well. And it was like a, it, 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 a lot of the people, I think, in like the, you know, the 60s, the 70s, that sort of thing, they played on the problems with um like race in the country. And and again, those were real problems, but they used it to kind of recruit people into socialism to build a more fair and, and equal society when that's not what they ended up building. They ended up building, you know, basically dictatorships. Giant burning questions anyone has. Uh, I'll, I'll sort of quickly describe how we'll be doing this and then we'll get to it. This class is what we call a read along class. So it's a short essay, and what we're going to do is all of the students and me are going to take turns reading passages and discussing them. Now, a lot of times when we're reading or talking to each other, uh, we tend to, to be polite, not interrupt. And a lot of times when you're doing something like this, you can sort of read past a part that you might have a question on. So I want to make sure everybody in the class here knows that if you have a question, feel free to interrupt whomever is reading, uh, be it me, be it, uh, you know, Kyle, or I see JV over here, uh, and Rod, everybody, uh, as long as you're polite about it, right? So, you know, no, no saying, hey, shut up, I got something to say. None of that, right? Um, just go, hey, quick question, can we stop? And we'll discuss a question and sort of discuss in a group content way. Uh, yeah. With that being said, is there anybody that wants to start reading for us? Now, you should have the PDF file pulled up. Uh, if the link isn't there, Kyle will put it in the text chat. Uh, or if you have a paper copy of the book, like my uh, really beaten up. I should do. I should do a class like this with my book. I'll be like, does anyone want to read out loud from my book and teach us about the woke ideology? I actually did do that when the book came out. I did like a book club. Maybe maybe it's time for another actively unwoke book club, intro book club. Let me know if you guys would be interested in something like that. Version here. It is from the book uh, History of the Three Internationals. It's basically the same thing. It's sort of a scanned version. So, yeah. Who'd like to start us off reading? I I can start. Awesome. Awesome. Welcome, JV, by the way. JV from RBN. He's one of our favorites. <laughs> so I'll be starting with the first paragraph says the Communist League was made up. No, it's um the major principles of awesome. Marxist socialism. All right. Well, I see a lot of people in the chat would be interested in a book club. So maybe, maybe we'll do a little book club. That would be fun. Begins with the uh, the oh. sentence prior to 1848. Okay, I got it. So the first paragraph, right? Okay. It says prior to 1848, the movement for socialism was a welter of confusion regarding the analysis of capitalism, organizational forms, methods of struggle, and the conception of the ultimate goal. It was a mixture of pri of private. <laughs> sorry. Primitivism, utopianism, adventurism, and opportunism. But Marx, actively aided by Engels, was one. What, what page, excuse me, but what page are we on? Uh, of the book, the actual page, I believe, was 22. 20, and if you're looking at the video, it should be page 17 of the document. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're uh, welcome. Page. We'll let you. Okay, people in the chat are asking that I pin the link to buy the book. Hang on, I'll get you the direct link on Amazon, and I will uh, pin that up. You can also you can always go to uh, activelyunwoke.com, but let me just pin the link to the actual Amazon 
page. And guys, if you have read my book, if you wouldn't mind leaving me a review on Amazon, that would be great. I haven't asked for that in a while, but let me just get this link set up. If you guys want to buy my book, I'm not going to say no. Buy my book. And it's a, there's a hardcover version, there's a Kindle version, and there is a audio version available on Audible um, that I did read. So I'll put that over on Rumble too. And uh, thank you guys. I do appreciate it. Let us know when you got there so we can keep going. I don't want to leave you behind. It's page 15 for me. Okay, page 15. I apologize. I'm going from the paper version, so... I, I might be a little bit page different from you guys. But it's, for me, the PDF, it's page 27 of the actual original text. So. Do I sound, do I sound crazy reading it at times two on Audible? Now I feel self-conscious. All I different versions of it. So uh, I apologize for that. Um, okay. Is everyone, does everyone have, the beginning of the major principles of Marxist socialism. Okay, now, now I've got it. Um, it awesome. looks like I've read the wrong thing for the class, though. Oh, that's okay. Well, it's a read along class, Fine. so we're reading it again now, anyway. <laughs> I uh, I downloaded the wrong one. I couldn't uh, download the PDF, so I looked up the. Um, I just love the beginning Williams of this class. It's such a clusterfuck. The, this is um, Marxism in action, guys. Uh, history of the three internationals. Yeah. And I took uh, page seven. Never speak of this again, Benjamin. It's a traumatic experience for me. On um, <laughs> general economic and political background. Mm. I, think was, we're, I think we're having an issue of the, uh, the, the different editions of the book. Um, Kyle, yeah. you, can you link them the banned thought version? Uh, I did. So that's in the chat if everyone wants to get it. Okay. Um, I can step away for a moment and take some pictures and upload those to a, a doc or something that everyone can access if that's helpful. No, I think the Ben Thought version is the exact same version I have. Um, so that way we can all be on the same page. So if you go to the link in the chat, uh, that'll take you there. You can just read it in a browser if that works. All right, why don't you keep going, Jay? Can you tell us exactly where to go again now that we're all on the same dock on the, the Ben Salt link? Yeah. Go ahead and tell them that. Info, this is just so classic. Uh, yep. Let me scroll to it here. This is like a parody I just opened it of myself, what it's so like to run a class. Along with everybody else. Oh, it's all good, brother. Marxism in action, guys. Right here. <laughs> They could well, just share their that. screen. They're um, on a Zoom. I just want to say hi to everybody. It's awesome to see you all here again. <laughs> so I was really, suck really technology. <laughs> impressed uh, by the last. This is this is what makes it even more pathetic that we're losing to these people. Socialists are so effing bad at technology. Every single week, they're having a different problem. God, class. We have such a great group of people here from all over the working class, different parts of the world. And it's just really cool seeing everybody get together to do the necessary work to educate ourselves. Right. Dude, and no, helping works. each other do that is absolutely essential. Um, if we if we don't have knowledge, we don't have anything. So I think that's really, really awesome to see. Go ahead, Kyle. So they may have changed something from when we uploaded it. I'm not seeing it. All right, hold on. I'll, I'll let me see if I can. We are losing badly, Dear, extremely um, badly. Kyle or Noah, <laughs> is it possible for whichever one of you has access to screen share and we can read off the screen with you, so we're all on the same page, literally? Oh, wonderful! It won't it won't load on my computer. Oh, it's just taking a long time. <laughs> Uh, ben thought does take forever to load. So give me a minute. Um, this is the unfortunately, best. my screen is sharing because we're streaming this live. So I can't do that. Uh, I just don't think it will work. I'm truly, truly the best. 99.9% .9 sure that this version that this he is, 
is this is the online version of the socialist I conference. Just need to find it real the Democratic quick. Socialist Conference. I, I apologize. When is the Democratic Socialist Conference? Maybe I should go to the Democratic Socialist Conference. That would be fun. Guys, to everybody, uh, this is like I had it set up beforehand, and Kyle's saying something changed. So that is wild because Banthod is a very old site. Uh, it's still loading. Exactly. Though, this is why this is a three hour class. <laughs> Only I something have, with tech, right? Uh, I mean, it never I fails. Have what was, I, ha I have what was linked to in the document for the syllabus. Yeah. Hang on. So, Angelo asks um, why don't these people just create their utopia commune and leave us alone? I think that that is a very good question. That if there are any socialists in the chat right now, I would like them to answer that. I don't know the answer to that. No, I'm not talking about that socialism conference. That's a different thing. Um, I'm talking about like the Democratic Socialists of America convention. That socialism conference is a different. No, no, that is already on my radar, Trendelin. Don't worry about that. Um, and then we have a super chat from Jen. Thank you for the super chat. And Jen, I'm sorry I didn't uh, select any of your selections for today, but I just couldn't resist this three-hour class. I feel like this is the series uh, community, but with a socialist. If you've seen community, you know, for like like that community college show. Yeah, this is like this is this is like the office version of like of like socialism. I agree, Jen. Thank you. Yeah, this is that same one. It's page 15 of the PDF at page 27 of the original book. That's it. That is it precisely. I'm looking at it right now. So on your document, on the link shared, it's page 15. And if you're looking at the actual pictures of the pages, it's 27. I'll give everybody a minute to just get to that real quick. I'm so glad we've, we've worked um, that out. 15 minutes and later we'll, get, we'll we'll keep going do you want to keep reading jay or oh <laughs> awesome awesome go, I, why don't you go ahead? i missed it i missed okay. it it was on my birthday well close to my birthday you want me to start over dang yeah that's probably a good next idea. year trendling next okay. year so it's prior to 1880 i'm oh, sorry prior to 1848 the movement for socialism was a welter of confusion regarding the analysis of capitalism organizational forms methods of struggle and the conception of the ultimate You haven't goal. missed anything, Barefoot. It was a mixture of primitivism, utopianism, adventurism, and opportunism. But Marx, actively aided by Engels, with one masterly, masterly stroke in the Communist Manifesto, swiped aside all this idealism, ignorance, and eclecticism, and put the socialist movement for the first time upon a scientific basis. As Engels said 35 years later in this famous address at the grave of Marx, quote, just as Darwin discovered the law of evolution in organic nature, so Marx discovered the law of evolution in human history. End right. quote. I'm going to interrupt you, Are you right shitting there, me? Jay, because this line mm -hmm. is absolutely essential. Marx to understand. discovered the law of evolution uh, in human let's, history. Let's read that again. Just as Darwin discovered the law of evolution in organic nature, uh, so Marx discovered the law of evolution in human history. Now let's think about that. What what could he mean, and how does that differ from uh, the way we're taught to think about Marxism? How are you taught to think about Marxism, um, Noah? Well, from what I've I've observed just from reading this, is basically just gives us a a better human, uh, a better understanding of ourselves as humans. Um, and I think I remember someone saying this on TikTok as of, as of recently, was that, uh, you know, what we know as Marxism or Marxist Leninism or even communism has actually existed in many indigenous cultures throughout history. It's just there wasn't an actual name or phrase put to it for Seriously? us to, to understand it. So when people say that communism is only a few couple hundred years old or something like that, that's actually inaccurate. It's actually as pretty much as old as human history. But the thing is, is that. So now we know why they're always doing land blessings and that sort of thing, because they believe that indigenous cultures were communist. 
And so therefore, communism is the highest evolved form of society that we can possibly get to because the indigenous cultures were communists. That explains a lot right there about the woke progressive hierarchy and why it exists the way it does and why indigenous people are always up at the top of the hierarchy. Black people are always up at the very tippy top. You can never usurp them. But indigenous people are like right under black people in the woke progressive hierarchy. We haven't actually had a, a, an actual scientific analysis of what it is as of late. And so because of that, a lot of us are now starting to you know, put the word with it. You know, we sometimes we didn't have words to actually go with what we may have felt or we, we may have observed, but Marx and Engels actually put it together. That's very, that's very, so uh, you're right about all of the, the substance here, right? What Marx mm -hmm. talks about is uh, the return to the community on a higher stage of development, right? So, Basically, what Marxism is, what it does, is it describes the general laws by which society itself develops, how it's developing and what drives that motion. The premise of everything in Marxism, what we study is motion, uh, it's history. And uh, what Marx basically figures out is that when private property begins developing, society is alienated from itself. The community that was there before uh, this property existed is alienated. And this property then goes through different forms and classes form and struggle against each other, uh, developing something newer, something newer. And Basically, and we'll learn about this later. We're getting a little ahead of ourselves. Basically, we end up at the negation of this and the negation of that negation being a return to community uh, from scarcity to abundance that way. And we'll get to that. That's a lot for to take out of one sentence. But really what I'm driving at is that we're talking about the general laws of development of human society. So just like Darwin talked about uh, the laws by which, you know, biological beings evolve. Marx does this for society. Do you want, oh, you can keep going, by the way, Jay. I had uh, just a quick comment. Janet asked an interesting question. Janet says, Carlin, are you, are you gonna write a book based on the things you've learned over this past year? I've definitely thought about it, Janet. I've thought a lot about the next book I want to write, and um, I have a lot of ideas. I have a lot of I have a lot of interests, as you guys know. There are different things that uh, catch my fancy at any given moment. Um, but one of the books that I do definitely have top of mind is this idea of um, like real life dystopia, something like that, like like showing how socialism is showing up in real life, talking about like what these people are actually doing, what they're talking about based on not only all this, but all the research I've done before, like, you know, going to their events, actually like listening to them again, learning from them, um, all this stuff. So it's, it's, it's not out of the, uh, the, the realm of possibility that I will do that at some point. Um, We'll see, though. I think if I do that, I'm just going to do a self-published thing. And I think I'm just going to, like, probably try to crowdfund it. Um, and we'll see if people want to uh, want to support learning about real life uh, socialism. And I do think it's the next logical step because it's like actively unwoke is um, <clears throat> it's kind of like your introduction to the woke ideology. And I think it's a very necessary primer. But I wrote actively unwoke two years ago. It came out a year ago, but I wrote it two years ago. And so since since the original book came out, first of all, the world has changed. Secondly, in interacting with so much socialism, my understanding of this ideology has gone like off the effing charts. And so I definitely want to do kind of like a like a part two, like a more advanced kind of like, here's what's actually going on and here's where all these ideas come from. I'm also a little scared of it if I'm honest about it because I'm just I'm 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 worried about descending into madness, but we'll see. 
Jackie says, I start. I read the Communist Manifesto more than 20 years ago, but I started to read it again. It is necessary to defeat them. Well done, Jackie. I definitely recommend everyone read the Communist Manifesto. It's short. It's available for free on the internet. And you will be able to see all their ideas showing up if you read it now. And it is scary. So well done, Jackie. Have you heard any socialists that are neither malevolent nor ignorant? I think that a lot of socialists, um, I think that they genuinely think that they're doing the right thing because they haven't thought through to the logical end conclusions of, of their actions. Um, first, that speech at the grave of Marx is a great speech and just that you can really see the powerful partnership between the two in that speech. Uh, but also it firmly establishes humans in that material base of natural development, that idealism, you'll get people just recognize the natural development of things, but still place humans above that. And that's where like idealism really comes in, whereas materialism brings it down on that same level where human society is just an extension of natural development. So thus they follow the same, not the same, but similar natural laws. That's a really, really good point and a comment on sort of bourgeois ideology. Um, the ideological, more idealist view would uh, take humans as outside of this general natural development, whereas Marxism exposes us as part of it, as an essential part. Uh, but yeah, unless anyone has anything else to add, we'll keep going. Well, I, I just want to say, oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Oh, I just want to say that I think this is interesting because I was listening to a conversation between some people last night, and one of them was trying to say, one of them was was a religious person and trying to say that Marxism was against, was it the dialectics of Marxism would make it to where uh, we're not focusing on um, becoming one with God, right? Like that was his, that was his whole premise, right? And that was the way that people used to understand that. And the person who was the, the, the comrade who was engaging with this person was saying, well, that doesn't necessarily align because we're trying to, because what you're, because there's the class antagonisms that got the people to write about that necessary evolution are the same class antagonisms as this today. And whether or not we agree with the religious connotation of getting you know closer to God or whatever, um, socialism is a material evolution. And so uh, he was trying to say that doesn't necessarily contradict. Um, basically. That's a good point. So the, the subject of religion and Marxism has a very long and controversial history. Um, but in the, here in the U.S., it's pretty important to note that communists have always had a very close relationship with churches and things like that. A lot of the leaders of our Communist Party were religious people. Um, I, I've spoken to a few sort of uh, Catholic Marxist Leninists from South America, and I, I mean, I can't speak for them or explain their views, but just to put like a sort of umbrella over it, they view the development of their relationship uh, with the divine or whatever as a material phenomenon so society going through this same really? process marxism discovers is very literally for them um the re the relationship of understanding who people are in relation to god uh at the same time though you know i'm not religious so i can't really say but that's how they view it and i get it you know well, I can can I uh, go into this because uh, a lot of people don't know this, but I actually preached door to door for over twenty years. Cool. And one of the things that uh, I notice is that whenever you go into the Abrahamic religions, um, they all express some sort of socialistic thought and socialistic principles within even their divine laws. For instance, in the Mosaic Law, one of the things was the law of gleaning. That basically means that when you harvest your crops, you are to leave some of what you did not get. Don't go back and grab the rest. This is to allow the people within the area, especially the orphans and widows and those who are more disenfranchised, 
to go behind and grab what you didn't get. Basically meaning that, you know, they are, they sees them as workers and they're working for their means of production by grabbing, you know, and foresting after you. And then you are able to have that for yourself in order to feed yourself. And so you have that. Then also, you know, you know, the apostle Paul uh, actually talks about how there should be a equalizing taking place within us that those who have much don't have too much and those of us with little don't have too little. So really, even when you go to Judaism or you go to Christianity, there's actually really a, a, a Marxist type thought even amongst them before it was ever you know, identified as socialistic or communistic. I and so that's... it jive well with religious thought. It actually jives well more with religious, especially with Christian thought than it does with, than capitalism does. <clears throat> so to be honest with you, uh, you know, Christians are actually more aligned with communism if they actually apply true Christianity versus applying capitalism. I think that's a good point. And I think Christians are aligned with communism if they apply real Christianity and not capitalism. He just implied that Christians are worshiping at the altar of capitalism. And if they were really Christian, they would absolutely be communist. Beautiful. Just beautiful. Just beautiful. Capitalism isn't about donating and helping the poor. <laughs> People confound generosity and socialism. Yep. Vince says he's got 12 years of Catholic education that says otherwise. Milo says Jesus was not a Marxist. No one starved under his leadership. That's right. No one starved under Jesus' Jesus's leadership. He made more fish and, and loaves for everyone. Pope Leo the Thirteenth uh, debunks that nonsense, but Christianity supports private property. Oh, are we going to overlook that, Marxist? How do you feel about Christianity supporting private property? That, um, you know, religion. The these religions. He wasn't cheating with magic, H. Tom. He was he was he was manifesting more fish and loaves via capitalism. Really, their spirit of generosity really, really is against the material interests of the ruling class of our era. I mean, there's really no way uh, to say it's not. Uh, especially the the parasitism of finance capital, but I don't want to get like sort of in the weeds. We could talk about this forever. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, so let's get back to the text because we got a bit to go. Can through. I say something that's specific to what we just read, though, about yeah, of comparing it to a scientific basis? I think part of that has to do with the kind of material circumstances that Marx and Engels were in themselves, which is coming off of the age of enlightenment. And we're now in this age of scientific discovery and industrialization, and we are getting efficient and better. And I think not only did that probably impact the way they were thinking about it, but when you want to, you know, teach other people or, you know, bring other people on board of this, uh, you know, way of thought, using terms and concepts that are already sort of embedded that make there's more of an affinity created there if you kind of use the terminology or the concepts that are already kind of dominant at the time and that that's kind of gets into like i have a sociology bachelor's degree it's a ba if i had done you know biology it would be a bs because there's this thought that uh you know there's the hard science and the soft science or whatever the social sciences are the soft sciences so I think that this is sort of a, you know, I think that idea of that this being a science is kind of grounded in those, um, those, I was being kind know, of facetious cultural ideas at the it. time, dominant ideas that are still dominant today yeah, about it. science sort of being the end all be all. Because even the word science, how we use it today, 
only came into use in that way just around the just uh, within a hundred years, late seventeenth, late seventeen hundreds. So I think that is a big part of why we talk about it. You know, it, I think it's accurate. But I'm a big social science person, so I think it's not that you know. <laughs> I think they're legitimate sciences anyway. So <laughs> that's that's really really intuitive, sister. Um, what you're described at the beginning there is <laughs> something we'll be learning in detail in this class is to quote Marx, right? It is not the consciousness of man that determines his existence, but instead his social existence that determines his consciousness. Or to put it more simply, it's the world around us that creates us, that shapes who we are, determines what characteristics we are, we have, and the way we look at things. And it took and all like of this development of for Marx and Engels to get to the point of developing scientific of socialism, right? So, uh, and, and we'll get to that. Actually, our next class will really zone in on that. So if you have any notes, write them down so we can discuss that next week because it'll be fantastic. You'll love that one. Um, why don't, for now though, why don't you continue reading, Jay? Sorry, I was, I was muted. Marxism, during its century of life, has irresistibly triumphed over the host of confusions and illusions bred of capitalism that have plagued the working <laughs> class on its advance to emancipation. <laughs> Every other theory and world outlook lies in ruins, in quote, says Dutt, quote, shattered and impotent before the march of events, in quote. This cannot Marxism be serious. first formulated basically in the Communist Manifesto becomes ever more expanded and powerful with the passage of the decades. All right, I'm going to stop you there. What he's talking about was the excitement around the, the formation of Marxism itself. Finally, there was a scientific way of explaining all of this development in history that exposed the erroneous nature of the previous bourgeois views. Uh, we're going to go right into the second paragraph. I'm like envisioning in my head right now. I'm like envisioning one of those propaganda videos where like, like, do you guys like it? So if anyone's like seen the movie 1984, which I actually think they did a pretty good job with the movie version of it. But like there are these scenes in 1984 where there are just spontaneous demonstrations of the proletariat in like in like cheering Big Brother and all the things that Big Brother has done. And it's so false and contrived. And they're all just in the town. And they're all cheering Big Brother. And they're all happy that Big Brother increased the chocolate ration when in fact he didn't increase the chocolate ration. It decreased. But then and they they edited the newspaper to make it seem like it was an increase and they are there these spontaneous demonstrations and gratitude that's what i feel like i've got in my head right now when they're they're talking about like how when when marxism was like put out there the 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 the, the, the populace was so excited that finally they had this thing and they just burst into these spontaneous demonstrations in support of marx Yes, they had the hate sessions, but they also had the spontaneous demonstrations of love for Br Big Brother. Now I want to watch that movie again. Maybe I'll do that later. Does anyone want to take up uh, reading next? I can. Go for it. All right. Who said I can first? Uh... I'll yield if the other person wants to. I don't care. All of you. All right, let's come on. Um, well, actually, you go ahead because I've lost my page on accident. So <laughs> all good, I got you. Stalin thus defines Marxism. Well, yeah, the book is always Marxism better than the film. The I'm just saying they did a fairly good job. Governing the development of nature and society, the science of the revolution of the oppressed and exploited masses the science of the victory of socialism in all countries, the science of building a communist society. Marxism is the science of the victory of socialism in all countries. I just want to listen to that part again. Who said I can first? Uh, I'll yield if the other person wants to. I don't care. All of you. All right, let's come on. Um, 
Well, actually, you go ahead because I've lost my page on accident. So <laughs> oh, good, I got you. Stalin thus defines Marxism. Marxism is the science of laws governing the development of nature and society, the science of the revolution of the oppressed and exploited masses, the science of the victory of socialism in all countries, the science of building a communist society. And Lenin thus describes the basic composition of Marxism. Marx was the genius who continued and completed the three chief ideological currents of the 19th century, represented respectively by the three most advanced countries of humanity, classical German philosophy, classical English political economy, and French so socialism combined with French revolutionary doctrines. Major among the basic elements of Marxism are the following. All right, now before we get to the the all these elements, uh, what is Foster saying here, right? He's quoting Lenin talking about what we were just talking about, right? That Marxism didn't come from nowhere. Marxism didn't arrive in Marx's head like magic. Um, it couldn't have been uh, uh, developed in a prior period. It took all of this materiality, this history going into it for Marxism to arise out of these things, right? It's part of an entire history of human thought and action and exposes the relationship between thought and action, what creates thought and how those actions affect things going forward into the future. Um, does anyone have any questions or do, or do we want to get right into it? Yeah, I had a question. Go I'll ahead. Point those out real quick. I'm sorry to cut you off, my friend. Um, for those who asked, I had like four people ask. Um, I, I think there's something wrong with that link. So I went ahead and put a new link of some, just some photos of the actual book. So they're all in order. The page numbers are at the bottom. So for those who were missing it and weren't sure we were, where we were at, you should be good to go now. I just want to throw that out. Thank you so much, brother. Uh, who had a question? Uh, the question was um, the Lenin quote references French socialism, which I, I guess obviously means French socialism was a movement before Marxism. Um, and when we're talking about it today, most people will conflate the two. So when you say socialism, you mean Marxism. Um, so I guess, is there like a brief explanation you could give about what French socialism was before Marxism? That's a good question. Yeah, that's a really, really good question. And we're actually going to later on in this course uh read angles on this subject exactly um french socialism what he's talking about here is what we often refer to as utopianism right so saint simon uh if i can do a funny french accent because I, i'm not good with other languages uh saint simon was one of the leading thinkers and france is really where the doctrine itself developed uh, because the conditions there were naturally inclining them towards this. Uh, France is where the communards arose and the Paris Commune uh, it came into being, right? And it's not just the thought, but the actions stemming out of it that create the conditions for Marx and Engels to do their work in overcoming the limitations of utopianism. And Engels will get into that, like we don't need to do uh, go super deep on that right now. Basically, we're just saying Marxism is scientific, whereas what came before in France was utopian. It was sort of um, dreaming up notions of an ideal, better society as if the ideas just come to us. Uh, rather than the organic class struggle and understanding it. Um, I appreciate the, the, the acknowledgement of important prior contributions. Um, 
I just take a little bit of issue, maybe like from an anthropological point of view. Hang on. I got a super chat from Queen Beth of the chat. Speaking of links, Carlin, are you going to check out all the links they give in the footnotes? Think of a plethora of information there is to be smart. Yeah. I mean, Beth, they've even got more links over on their website that I started to look at earlier and it was just like too much. They have a lot. They have a lot. I don't think they actually have the links in the uh, in the um, actual footnotes here. They don't have the links here, so they're only doing it like on their website. But um, there is a lot on their like. See, see, here's the thing: is like, I personally, I prefer observing what they do rather than digging into the literature. Sometimes I have to read the literature, but honestly, like James Lindsay does such a good job of that. I don't need to reinvent the wheel. James Lindsay reads the literature. He drives himself insane reading the literature. I watch the trainings. And so I, I I feel like if I was digging into the literature all the time, I would like that's all I would be doing. But I'm not opposed to it. I'm just like, I only have so many hours in the day. So. But no, there's a lot of good, good links and good information. And I'm reading transgender Marxism already, right? Oh, you meant the book? <sighs> I don't know, Beth. I don't know. Let me get through transgender Marxism first, and then I'll get back to you, all right? Guys, please remember to mount that like button for me. Socialism Saturday is every Saturday at 6 p.m. We watch real socialists. We learn what they're thinking. We learn their language. We, we learn what they're planning, stuff like that. We are watching the basics of Marxism to this week. Say hi in the chat if you're new. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Calling... German, French, and English, like, the most advanced of all humanity, like, whatever. That's not necessary. Well, you, so, I get what you're saying. Yeah, it's, it's um, Eurocentric. It's Eurocentric, but, sh well, fine. But well, i just acknowledging that. What, what, the, what you'll see is how they uh, describe this is based in how far along the productive forces were. Right? So, rather than, like, a, a uh, more, like, I'm trying to e e equality based view where you just see where we see things as different in different areas. What Marx and Engels are going it. to argue is that colonialism and things of this nature stagnate the development of other nations. So, for example, uh, our ruling class colonizing uh, multiple countries in Africa, uh, the destruction of Vietnam, etc., Per, like they they hold these in a state of underdevelopment and not allowing their productive forces to continue going, which creates the thought behind everything else. So it, it, it's basically a productive statement rather than uh, a an equity statement, if that makes sense. It makes some sense. I just think that's still got some underlying just assumptions which are there. That's all. It's part of what it would is. It, would it be more like would would a good comparison be like how uh, China, for instance, is like arguably the most developed um, like society probably on the planet, given its like uh, length of like singular leadership, but because of the effects of like the Dutch and the the British and of course like the Russians and like basically the whole conglomerate of European powers. Bingo! Um, Congratulations, it became well done. The industrial or like de developed. Um, you would say like materially. So it got to a point where it it took a socialist revolution um, in the in the nineteen uh, hundreds to catch china back up to being the like forefront of society precisely and then they've gone with socialism they've been able to go so much further right i mean they're breaking records and records of uh increases in the standard of living eliminating poverty technology etc uh because of the power that socialist revolution gives the people um, any, anything else before we, we go on? Um, I wanted to just give Jay some extra uh, reading just about French socialism. Marx wrote extensively on um, on France's history, and he has uh, three books. Uh, one would be The Class Struggles in France. Uh, the second would be The Civil War 
in France. And then the third would be the 18th. I can't say that word. Br Brumaire. Br Br it's uh, just Brumaire. Uh, Napoleon. Yeah. Yeah, and I'll put those in Br the chat. Even today is one of the best books I've ever read, and I read like a monster. You would not believe how much I read. Uh, I'm kind of a nerd. Okay. Um, well, I would oh, love to stay on this topic. We do have a bit more to get through. So, um, why doesn't someone begin with our first? uh principle here which is philosophical materialism philosophical materialism marx based himself upon the reality of the world as against the metaphysical imaginings of the idealistic philosophers george berkeley david hume emmanuel kant george wf heigl and the many uh Hegel, and the many others whose systems by one route or another all led to the acceptance of religion and to the conception of an artificial external creation and operation of the world. Marx counterposes a world ruled by natural law against the bourgeois metaphysical concept of a world under the arbitrary guidance of some remote divinity. To him, materiality is fundamentally and all thought and understanding flow is, I'm sorry, is fundamental and all thought and understanding flow from it. All right, I'm going to stop you real quick. Um, we just had a, a brief discussion on religion now, here we see sort of one of the um, old controversies, right? A lot of communist parties spoke like this on religion when the underlying thought, however, uh, should be more against dogmatic thinking, right? So anything that sort of doesn't look for genuine material answers, but just takes a thing as given. Uh, and we'll go into dogmatism and what that is in another class. I just wanted to make that announcement. Why don't you continue reading, though? Engels says the great basic question of all philosophy, especially of modern philosophy, is that concerning the relation of thinking and being spirit to nature, which is primary spirit or nature, which is primary spirit or nature, the answers which the philosophers gave to this question split into two great camps. Those who asserted the, prim the primacy of spirit to nature, and therefore, in the last analysis, assumed world creation in some form or another, comprised the camp of idealism. The others, who regarded nature as primary, belonged to the various schools of materialism. All right, um, let's stop there. I want to sort of explain idealism and materialism in basic terms, right? So it's really, and this comes down to the uh, these sublation, to use Marxist jargon, of Hegel's system in Marx, right? So uh, it's the difference between what drives forward motion in history. We can all see that history happens, right? Um, we're no longer in various tribes or clans etc but why so for the idealists funny, it <laughs> is the ideas we have that come unbidden for the materialist um and i would actually say that hegel is something of a proto-materialist um that gave marx the the impetus to carry his system forward uh for materialism it is that materiality itself so uh, the, the quote I, I mentioned earlier is a perfect example of this, right? It is not the consciousness of man that determines his existence, but on the contrary, his social existence that determines his consciousness. So we see and are created by the world around us. What forms a thought in our head is already being determined by what we're perceiving. Uh, does no, that make sense? Does no, anyone have questions no, about it? No, no, no. It is exactly the opposite, Noah. What? It, let me just listen to what he said again. Like, hang on. What forms a thought in our head is already being determined by what we are perceiving. That's what he just said. What forms a thought in our head is already be being determined by what we are perceiving. That is not correct noah 
what we perceive is a direct result of the thoughts we form in our head. The thoughts come first. The perception comes second. The perception does not come first after the thoughts. Or excuse me, like the prior to the thoughts. There we go. So no, that is fundamentally backwards, Noah. See, and this is where, this is where, like, this is where all, like, the Gnosticism stuff comes in and why I, why I fundamentally believe that the Gnosticism stuff is being bastardized by these people. I don't think they're doing an accurate interpretation of it. I understand why people think all this is related to Gnosticism. I really do. But what people need to understand is it is a bastardization of Gnosticism, just like they're trying to bastardize Christianity every time they say Jesus was a communist, just like they're trying to bastardize Judaism when they when they say that that's a communist thing. Like it's, it, it is exactly the same thing. It is a bastardized version that they do not fully understand what they're talking about. And most people don't understand like this whole ideology as well as they think they do and so that they un they believe that the bastardized version of gnosticism that shows up with these people and what james Lindsay talks about is is what gnosticism is but it's not they have it backwards it's system forward uh for materialism it is that materiality itself so uh, the the quote I, I mentioned earlier is a perfect example of this, right? It is not the consciousness of man that determines his existence, but on the contrary, his social existence that determines his consciousness. So we see and are created by the world around us. What forms a thought in our head is already being determined by what we're perceiving. Wrong, Noah. Uh, wrong. Does that make sense? Does Backwards. anyone have questions about it? That's not correct. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, what? Um, does... Oh, go ahead. Uh, just like if you ever study uh, kind of like the ancients, they'll talk about like the form. So like there's the form of a chair. Like there's chairness, but you're not actually sitting in a chair. It's the embodiment of the idea of chairness. When I studied it in my undergrad, it was driving me nuts trying to understand it. And when I'm not actually sitting in a chair, my chair is embodying the idea of chairness. That's quite literally like I, I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in a chair right now because we. We as society have defined the structure that I'm sitting in as a chair, not an embodiment of the idea of chairness. I don't even know what that is. I need to listen to that again. Yeah, I'm I'm sitting in an avatar of chairness. Is anyone else sitting in an avatar of chairness right now? Let's listen to that again. That was just like a great line. If you ever study... Uh, kind of like the ancients, they'll talk about like the form. So like there's the form of a chair, like there's chairness, but you're not actually sitting in a chair. It's the embodiment of the idea of chairness. When I studied it in my undergrad, it was driving me nuts trying to understand it. And when I studied Marx later on, it was like, oh, it's because I was a materialist all along trying to wrap my head around this idealism that really is not grounded in, that, in material. That must have uh, been what it so was all along. That if you ever study the ancients, I recommend studying idealism just to kind of, uh, you know, counterbalance your own material understanding. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point. It... Matthew says, next time I'm in a restaurant, I will ask for the embodiment of boothness. <laughs> Please do this, Matthew. <laughs> Please do it. That would be great. Let us know how that goes for you. Hang on. Yuri says, the first part is correct. The second part is wrong. Plato believed that there was a true idea of an object. For example, there is a perfect mug and all other mugs are simply an imitation of it. I mean, I guess, Yuri, I guess, like, I understand what you, like, the, 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 um, the intellectual game that's being played. I'm just like, 
at some point we need to like live in reality. We can't all be philosophers for a living. And um, and I'm pretty sure I'm not sitting in the embodiment of chairness. I'm I'm pretty sure I'm sitting in an actual chair. In in modern USA, that's all grounded in Kant, right? And uh, what what they call the thing in itself that that thing out there, it's there, but it is unknowable to us. I'm pretty sure my chair is very knowable to me. I've been sitting in it for a while. Shauna said, would you consider doing a deeper dive or something on it, like on Gnostics, so we can see the ways these people are getting Gnostics wrong? I don't really want to, Shauna, if I'm honest about it. I don't really, I'm not claiming to be an expert in, in, in Gnostic, in Gnosticism, but I do speak the language of woo rather fluently. And there's definitely overlap between woo and, and Gnosticism. And I just don't want to because it's like, it's just going to cause a fight. People are not going to understand it. I've tried talking about these topics before. People always use it as gotcha moments. It's like, no, James Lindsay's not talking about it correctly either. I'm sorry. James Lindsay, from what I've heard, I know he thinks he's talking about it correctly, but I don't think he is talking about it correctly. So I'm not going to recommend that. Um, he gets into something. I'm not sure it's really what Gnosticism is, though. In terms of like how people who practice understand it. But um, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see. Not right now. <laughs> right? We can't experience that. What we have instead is the idea in our heads of a thing there. But we are disconnected for, from it. What Marxism says instead is that the truth of this is in the relate. I'm not suggesting you guys shouldn't listen to James Lindsay's thoughts on it. I think you should listen to his thoughts on it. I think from my understanding... I could be wrong. I could be corrected later. I think he's getting some things wrong in his analysis. He's not saying it's pure Gnosticism. He's saying what these folks are intimidated in, in, in. Well, that makes me feel a little bit better than to hear that because how it's been presented to me is James Lindsay's been presenting this as Gnosticism and it's not Gnosticism. That's been my beef with it the entire time is people have been telling me that James Lindsay's saying that this is, and because I don't listen to him, guys, and it's not because I don't think he's great. It's because I don't want to be influenced by his ideas in terms of, like, my own analysis. I want to come to my conclusions first and then check in with him later. But what I've been hearing is that he's presenting it as this is what Gnosticism is. And I'm like, that's not what Gnosticism is. It's not. But if he's legitimately saying that they are imitating Gnosticism, that's not a message that's getting out to his audience. That's not what's coming through. And I think that that's an important point. Maybe he'll change the way he's talking about it. He does do that on occasion, but we'll see, I guess. Anyway. Relationship between that thing and our thoughts going back and forth and affecting each other. Um, why don't we... I have a question oh, yeah. on Go that. Ahead. Uh, I'm sorry, my English is not so good, but I will try to uh, explain what is my question is. Um, uh, he's I'm just um, that makes more sense. Curious to understand how far this materialism goes, because if we say okay, ma uh, materialism means that the material things are the things which um, which change everything and makes us uh, think or feel with, uh, everything, uh, then. Is there still two kinds of things like spirit and material? Or is it only material things there in my mind is also a kind of material thing that uh, is in relation with other material things? Well, I'm really glad. He said in one in the one I listened to earlier today that the classic Gnosticism is not what he's saying. He's using it as a structure that is being used by these. Well, I'm, I'm actually really glad to hear that, that he's starting to clarify that, because that was a point that was really starting to annoy me that he was making, because I'm like. I speak enough of this language that I know that this is not what this is. And if he's starting to clarify that and making sure that's clear to his audience, then that makes me that pleases me. I'm glad to hear it. Does it make uh, sense? Sense or 
No, that is a brilliant question, brother. Thank you for asking it. Um, what Mark says, and he actually has a quote about this, is that it is impossible to separate thought from matter that thinks. That the brain is only highly advanced matter doing what it historically developed to do. So uh, the spirit of, of Hegel, and this is going to get in, in the weeds if we go too far, so we won't, for Marxism is instead embodied within the material, rather than the material being the embodiment of the spirit, which is what Hegel said. I hope that that answers your question. Uh, I'm not sure because they're still not uh, not clear to me. Is there only is it also material, material thing? Yeah. My thoughts, for example, when I uh, when I learn mathematics, it's only structure. Is the structure also material thing, or is it would uh, would I say like you like you mentioned before that it is um, built. Um, in my in my in my in my brain so it it depends on material things mm. oh no that's a very good point i mean we do have thoughts right and we have free will um those are uh the, the those are created by what is but we still are thinking and these thoughts are a material process happening so um we actually there there's going to be more courses in the uh marxism Uh, school that are going to cover more like advanced dialectics, which we'll get into with this with uh, some of the thinkers that the Institute is very, very fond of, like uh, uh, Ivy Ilyenkov from Russia, who was who basically created uh, the school of creative Marxism in the Soviet Union. And the interesting thing about that, and I don't want to get in the weeds where we need to get back to the material, is that um, he directly engages with the relationship between subject and object, right? So the thing being thought about and the thoughts happening in an era where science was advancing about how the brain works. And uh, just as Engels said in those days, it must be said that the advancement of modern science more and more improves that nature. I literally just called him, got called a man hater on Twitter for pointing out that James O'Keefe is a fraud that tried to embezzle fucking money from his company. Anyway, back to this. Allotrope, do you think kids' ignorance of history is by design? Yes. If it is, which side, left or right, benefits more from it? The left. I think that the ignorance across the spectrum is by, by design. I think that it is no accident that kids can no longer um, read at a at a 12th grade level when they graduate from high school. They can no longer write at a 12th grade level when they graduate from high school. They can no longer do math. They can't think critically. They don't know about history. They don't know about art. They don't know about any of these things. I think that the dumbing down of the population is completely purposeful because it makes the population easier to control and being that the left controls all of the institutions and most importantly the left controls the schools they control the programs they control the curriculum they're the ones in charge of all of this i absolutely believe that it benefits the left more to have a dumbed down population that will not question anything that they do and that are very easy to control and that are so stupid that they can't do basic tasks, which makes them ultimately very dependent on the state. Now, the right could take advantage of it, too. Don't get me wrong. If the right was smart, they could take advantage of it, too. But they're not going to because they're so busy bickering and infighting and canceling each other and ignoring the actual problems in the world that they will never focus on stuff like that and how to use things strategically. So it, it benefits the left far more, I think. Works dialectically rather than what we call metaphysically. And we'll go into that too. But for now, 
because this this next section will also help us explain what materialism is. Uh, let's go into the next uh, paragraph. Why doesn't someone start reading that one? Okay, I'll go if nobody wants to. Marx was a supreme philosopher in the second camp, carrying the materialist conception into all branches of thought and action. Excuse me. The practical effect of philosophical materialism is to free Marxists and eventually the working class from the crippling influence of the innumerable hoary and reactionary conceptions relating to philosophy, science, government, religion, economics, morality, art, etc., which constitute the fundamental ideological buttresses of the capitalist system. Philosophical materialism is the sharpest intellectual weapon of the proletariat in its fight against capitalism and for socialism. So what he's saying is that as we learn this Marxism, this materialism, we'll be able to see through all of the misconceptions and ideologies that our ruling class gives to us and tries to tell us is the truth that sort of keeps us in our place, keeps us pacified, etc. Um, the next section I'm is a- dialectics. Can someone uh, start with that one, please? I have a quick comment. Oh, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Um, For just that passage. Hang on, let's look at the definition that they just put on the screen right here. Materialism. Matter is primary. Spirit, ideas, and thought is emergent, secondary property of highly organized matter. Does everyone understand? Um, it makes me think of when specifically the United States um, tells its people through the media that we're going to fight for like an arbitrary idea of um, human rights and like human rights being um, like a singular idea of human rights or a single idea of um, of like freedoms. So like not freedom to do something, just freedom in general. It never elaborates on that. And then I think I was listening to probably one of your videos um, and you guys were just talking about how it is all about freedom to do what exactly, freedom to say what precisely. And then this passage really brought that whole thing together for me. That's fantastic. Yeah. Lenin has a great quote on this. He says, freedom for whom to do what? And what this does is takes us into the realm of the concrete, right? Uh, These abstract freedoms don't exist. They're only in the airy and smoky realm of ideas. To speak of concrete freedom. Hang on. I got a super chat from Alatrope. Thank you, Alatrope. I was an Aussie kid in the 90s being taught to love China and refugees. Australia had a bicentenary in uh, in 1988, and I never learned about it. I'm angry. I am angry at all the things I was not taught to, Allotrope. When you wake up and you realize how much you were lied to and how much information was withheld from you and how much and, and how narrative driven everything you ever learned was it's a little bit well infuriating shauna says they're saying matter doesn't matter because it leads to property rights i wouldn't have been interpreted that way autumn but or not autumn shauna excuse me um but yeah yeah It is the freedom to live your life without hunger, etc., for the working people. Um, and uh, we just had, uh, I'm going to pull this one back up real quick on our stream. Um, I believe that's Carlos helping us out saying materialism, matter is primary, right? Spirit, ideas, and thought is an emergent secondary property of highly organized matter. So basically, our thoughts, spirit as a whole, et cetera, comes from materiality. That is the primary thing, the material organic world. 
may I add something real quick? Of course, brother. There's a philosopher that I like who always said, and this is how it cemented the idea for me, is he said, well, you know, thoughts come from our brain. And someone asked him, well, how do you know that? And he was like, well, I don't have thoughts if my brain gets damaged too badly. <laughs> and so I, that's super basic, but that's kind of how it helped me cement it. So that's really, that's really good. I like that. Why doesn't someone start us off? Um, I, I'm not sure. I, I have a I sort of family thing going on right now. I'm just going to step out in the hall for two seconds and answer a phone call because it's very important. I apologize for that. Uh, why doesn't someone pick us up though okay. from part two? Dialectics. Go slowly. <laughs> I can. I can, I can take it. Oh. All right, guys. So, dialectics. <laughs> Marx and Engels adopted the dialectics of Hegel from 1770 to 1831, which, as Lenin puts it, is the theory it of is. evolution, which is most comprehensive, rich in content, and profound. Dialectics. Uh, did we just read this part? Am I, are we on the next one? This is Mark's. Yeah, you're in the right spot. We're in the right, okay, good, good. Perfect. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing other things while you guys are talking sometimes. Okay, so dialectics, Mark says, is the science of the general laws of motion, both of the external world and of, the hum and of human thought. But, but in accepting Hegel's dialectic system, Marx and Engels stripped it of its idealism and developed it on a material basis. For dialectical philosophy, says Engels, nothing is final, absolute, and sacred. It reveals the transitory character of everything. You know, I'm starting to wonder, and, and this is just a general thought. It's not actually relating to what, what he's saying, but I, I kind of feel like, oh, God, this shows you I've been listening to too much narcissism content, I suppose. But I feel like Marxism and the people who engage in it it's a very narcissistic ideology and it's a very narcissistic culture because I don't actually believe these people care about anyone else, but they pretend to care about other people because it main maintains the facade of we just want fairness and equality. And we want everyone to be taken care of, but they don't actually care about people. They really don't. They don't care if people are okay. They don't care if people are taken care of. They don't care if people have what they need. They 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 get militant. If if you are assigned a job and you don't want to work that job, well, they're gonna say, Well, tough shit. It's eat you either work and you eat or or you don't eat. And it doesn't matter whether you like the job we've assigned you or not. It is a very heartless ideology. It's a very militant ideology. And I don't think it actually takes human need or human um, or humanity in general, human emotion, human need, any of these things into consideration within the ideology. And that strikes me as very much something that like a narcissist would do because a narcissist will pretend to care about you. They will they will put on the greatest show of caring about you. They will lift you up on that pedestal. They will shower you with praise and love and gifts and all these things to make you think that they care about you, but they really don't because they're not capable of it. They don't have that, that function in their brain. They don't know what it means to care about people. All they know is putting on the pretense of caring about people. And a lot of narcissists have no idea what they're doing. They actually think that they do care. They don't realize that they don't really care. And it's just all to maintain the facade. I don't know. That's just something I was thinking about. Everything and in everything, nothing can endure before before it accepts the uninterrupted process of becoming and of passing away, of endless ascendancy from the lower to the higher. Brilliant, brilliant part. Um, I appreciate your patience with me having to run out there. Uh, this is so important. The, the, this Marx quote in the uh, first sentence, Marx says this is the science of the general laws of motion, both of the external world and of human thought. 
meaning it's the relationship between those. And we'll find out as we learn about dialectics. Now, this is just like sort of a introductory making statements to make us think sort of class, right? But as we learn, everything, everything in Marxism is a study of this motion of life going from a lower to a higher, right? That nothing is static, nothing. Exactly, Taiwan, like in American All Psycho. things are exactly. changing. Exactly. Even when we think we're standing still as people, we're aging. The world is whirling around the sun. Everything is movement. And movement is caused by the relationship between, a po- well, we'll get into this. But it's just absolutely brilliant. I love that passage. Uh, why doesn't someone pick up from the, uh, oh, unless anyone has questions, I apologize. Yeah, go ahead. So I had a bit of difficult um, time understanding exactly what dialectics is. Uh, and I want to see if I got it a little bit. So my um, comparison would be dialectics is like the study of the forces of in physics, studying the entropy forces um, applied, the friction, gravity, and anal- analyzing all of that and seeing what that object does and goes to. Would that be it? It Yes and no. Uh, the first part of it, yes. But the second part, what we do is we look inside of a thing, right? Like, let's take society itself, because that's what Marxism mostly studies. Marxism is a whole way of viewing the world and everything, but we focus on society because we're people and that's what we're within. Hang on, we got a super chat from Rottweiler. Thank you, Rottweiler. There are some case studies out there pointing to the possibility that Marx was a malignant narcissist himself, so it's natural to attract others. Hmm. That's interesting, Rottweiler. That's fascinating. Going to have to look into that at some point. Thank you. I appreciate that. It wouldn't surprise me. So within society, we see after the advent of property and as this process begins uh opposed classes so there are two general classes within the phenomenon that are both interconnected being uh created by each other and interdependent dependent on each other for the existence or the old one is dependent on the new one to exist and they struggle against each other right um as the old force is dying away, this is the exact same process as the new force developing. So uh, to put it in another words, I like to use plant references because this is what Engels uses, right? Think about a seed in the ground, right? Within that seed is a little tiny sprout and they're in contradiction with each other. They create each other The sprout can't exist without the seed, and that seed is going to die away without the sprout. They struggle against each other, right? There is the new thing, the sprout, struggling against that hard outer shell until we get a revolutionary change where the sprout overtakes the seed and comes up from the ground, right? This is dialectics. Uh, It is a study of these interposed opposites creating change and motion which we will get into don't worry so you were you were like walking your way down that street sister you you got it can i just ask something uh, please can i of ask course. You? Oh, question. um is the the dialectic it's necessarily developed developed uh, progressive yes mm. Um, it's, wait, can you repeat that real quick? Towards, is the dialectical uh, the dialectic necessarily progressive? Um, it's not just dualities kind of banging off each other. It's actually creating. Mm. Very, yeah. very, very important thing to add. Absolutely. The dialectic is the creation of a new thing. It's not just two things just going around and around and around. It is a process of, like he says right here, 
endless ascendancy from the lower to the higher, right? So feudalism becomes industrial capitalism, becomes imperialism, becomes socialism, or whatever. It's different. We'll get to particular and universal later. But in general, that's what we're talking about. We're talking about constant motion and becoming. So would it be like, oh, my bad. Here you go. Well, okay. So from, from, from what I gather is that in, in the explanation of dialectical materialism, it means that the process in which the world and society is going in right now in, re, in, in relation to socialism is that socialism is, w- would it be ignorant of me to say that socialism is really an inevitability of human society that really that you know as, as capitalism keeps advancing capitalism is like a caterpillar that keeps eating the leaf and no matter what that it will turn into a cocoon and then it will come out as a socialist butterfly and it's like no matter what what it, it, it has to reach that conclusion it is is that a Capitalism is the caterpillar that will keep eating the leaf and then no matter what will go into a cocoon and turn out as a socialist butterfly. Bless his heart. Let's listen to that again. I want to understand more. Is that in, in the explanation of dialectical materialism, it means that the process in which the world and society is going in right now in, re, in, in relation to socialism is that socialism is, w- would it be ignorant of me to say that socialism is really an inevitability of human society that really that, you know, as, as capitalism keeps advancing Capitalism is like a caterpillar that keeps eating the leaf. And no matter what, that it will turn into a cocoon and then it will come out as a socialist butterfly. Well, yeah, I mean, exactly, Matthew, exactly, Matthew. If they if they actually believed in the inevitability of the outcome, then why are they even doing activism? They would like sit back, go to the movies, go out for ice cream, go bowling like have fun with their lives they wouldn't spend all their time reading so philosophers like if they actually believed that they would just let the natural evolution of society take place i would think let's see kurt said something kurt said historical inevitability capitalism must destroy itself with socialism being the perfection to follow like i said guys the four goals of the woke left are always and forever gain as much power as possible destabilize the system attack capitalism usher in their marxist utopia and they really do believe it will be a utopia i'm working on an article for the substack about like what their based on what we've done what their actual like ideal utopian world looks like and it looks more dystopian than it looks utopian but you know it's like no matter what it, it, it has to reach that conclusion. Is is that a terrible analogy or I'm trying to figure it's it out. It's a really no, bad that is analogy. Brilliant, no, brother. that's very intuitive. Brilliant. And the inevitability of socialism <sighs> is something that Marx himself talked about, right? But it's very important to understand that brilliant. in order for this to happen, there is a subjective factor that... Uh, the the conditions arrive, but we are an active part of this. And Marx has, if you guys want some supplementary reading, he has 11 theses that he wrote on Forbach, who was one of Hegel's students, who was sort of um, one of the first materialists within this school. And he explains in these 11 theses the relation between us interacting, that it is this that creates us, but we must take it upon ourselves to fulfill the historical role that society has laid out for us within the proletariat. 
Now, a little caveat, socialism, uh, as Marx, as Foster, as Lenin, whoever is talking about, is not what how we often think about it and what we're taught in the U.S. It doesn't have any particular characteristics. It is instead a general category, meaning a society that serves a social function or serves the well-being of society itself. And this is why Lenin says that the first stage of the new society or communist society must be socialism, right? It must be that kind of a society. Um, and for when we... Socialism is nothing more than the transition stage to communism. Democratic socialism is a way that people say, we're voting to transition to socialism, which is the inevitable transition stage to communism. We add our Marxist analysis to this in scientific socialism, we know through the general laws of development that we're going to be learning how this arrives, right? And that is why we focus on socialism as a general. But very intuitive, very, very intuitive. I also um, just wanted to offer some encouragement to Tiva just to keep to keep going at it. Um, just and, and the fact that you're entertaining all these questions so much, you're you're gonna get it. I mean, you're already getting it. A good simple example is to look at the change of states of form. Like if you look at an ice cube, it has that potential to just be, you know, regular room temperature water. So that's that guaranteed potential that that confusion seems to be but it has to have that physical action of being heated to a melting temperature if that jasmine did you see any drag queens grooming children at pride how did it, how did it go <laughs> i'm kidding yes socialism is just like an ice cube melting into water it is the inevitable state that the ice, which is capitalism, will melt into the water that is socialism. And if it gets hot enough, will eventually become the steam that is communism. That, that makes sense. That's like a simple example in nature of uh, changes of states of form for a dialectical example, if that makes sense. But you're on it. Keep, keep at it. You got it. Absolutely. You are walk like I said, you're walking down that road. By the way, a little buddy uh, arrived to join us back there. So everyone say hi to uh, Professor Hugo Chavez von Ginger Pants back there. Oh, there's a cat. Um, <laughs> um, I have a quick... Of course he has uh, a cat. Like, just uh, some for like clarity, uh, just to make sure I have it 100%. Um, would, dial would a dialectical relationship be sort of like how when like serfs went into like industry, the more like the you needed more capital and like you needed more materialist development in like the means of production and as like the capitalist got more workers he's sort of like writing his own like writing the revolution himself by like building more and more people into like the revolutionary like uh proletariat and then soon that proletariat is going to realize that they should be the they should be a different relationship than it Satan's becomes pets, a whole other okay, thing. Okay, allotrope. Precisely, brother. That's they're 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 tools insightful. of the devil. That is um capitalism creating its own grave diggers, right? The peasantry who had a somewhat stable way of uh life and existence was because uh the forces of production had advanced and they outmoded the old relations of production that feudal relationship, right? And so it throws all of these peasants into instability and proletarianization. And our middle classes these days are going through a very, very similar process that we call re-proletarianization, right? The formerly stable middle classes who had stability with home ownership, et cetera, are finding out that these loans are really just assets uh, for financial <laughs> you, speculation, right? And people are being I'm thrust down to the same Not level really. as the original industrial proletariat uh, working paycheck to pay. This is a cat-free YouTube channel, okay, people? You can keep your cats to yourself. I don't want to hear about it. Paycheck, <laughs> unable to accumulate even a little bit of stability for themselves. 
And that is forming this big mass of a re-proletariat. But that's my own theory, which will be out, by the way, by the end of this class. And we're going to go over. So I'm excited about that. Um, but yeah, everybody is doing great. You guys are really on your road to getting this. Let's continue on because we do have a bit more to go in the essay, though. Uh, I'm going to keep going. Dialectic. Oh, did someone else have something to say? I, I can. I, I can read if you'd like. Absolutely. Go for it. It's over the span of two pages, so I'll have to switch over to the next page. It says, uh, dialectical evolution, says Lenin, is a development <clears throat> that repeats, as it were, the stages already passed, but repeats them in a, in a different way on a higher plane, negation of negation. Okay, hold on. I got to stop you. I got to stop you. This is very important because it ties in to another aspect of Marxism we'll go over, which is I'm gonna make I'm gonna make a socialist cat because cats are the tool of the devil. I'm gonna make a socialist cat sticker with a fucking Marxist beret on it or something. And the dog will be the dog is the capitalist and the cat is the socialist. And that's the way it's gonna be. Is uh the difference between particulars and universals. Right, a universal is something that happens because of the general laws of development, right? But each time and place it happens within uh, has its own yeah. particular form. So a universal, <laughs> such as the proletariat, <laughs> must concretize in a particular form. So the reproletariat, right, that I was just speaking of, oh. is a new form of this same thing. Uh, we can also do this geographically right the chinese proletariat has a different particular form than the american proletariat does a different particular history created them and they have a whole process that is unique to the chinese nation now our national history has our own thing with our own unique forms of class struggle that create it and this is a really good uh quote from lenin that explains that a development that repeats, as it were, the stages already passed. So we go through all of these essential universal phenomenons, but they look different because they're on a different stage of development. The revolution of the proletariat is a revolution. It is society coming to a point where it can no longer continue on in the old way, but it is different in form uh, in particularity from the old bourgeois revolutions, right? And we can even do that again in a geographical manner. The American bourgeois revolution was not the same as the French bourgeois revolution. All right. Well, we'll learn more about that in a second, but we're going to take the super chat from Shauna. Cats are better than dogs because cats would never work for the police. Dogs are simple creatures, Shauna. Dogs just want people to love them. They just want pets and treats and belly rubs. You don't need to bribe a dog. Well, you do need to bribe a dog to get it to do stuff, like with a treat or something. But, like, dogs are very trusting, sometimes too trusting. And that's why that's why they want to work for the police. No, Peter, no. Cats are not capitalists. No. Dogs are, abs dogs are only communist. When they when it comes to, when it comes to their food, dogs are capitalist every other time except when it comes to humans having food, and then they become communist because they want they want your food. But dogs are dogs are very capitalist most of the time. I'm making a Che a Che Guerrera like in the form of a cat. I'm formulating this in my in my head right now. Exactly, cats are narcissists. I cannot believe how many cat lovers I have on my channel. Something has gone horribly, horribly wrong to have this many cat lovers on my channel. I've made a misstep somewhere. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be thinking about this. Right? Ours overthrew a, uh, a, a colonizing empire. Theirs overthrew a national uh, fuel class. It's it, all different particularities, right? <laughs> uh, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt that might be you with Just one question, though. Yeah. Uh, um. So I'm thinking about another analogy as you're saying this. 
could it, could it be like uh, two children growing up? They don't share the same DNA and they go through pretty much the same processes is that one will end up being six foot while the other one will end up being five, five, but they still end up going through the same processes where they have the pituitary gland secreting, you know, hormones so that they can get to a particular, you know, stage in life. Uh, so is that kind of like the same? Absolutely. That is the particularity of these two people, right? The same, uh, the same process is happening, but they have a different particular DNA makeup, which creates a different outcome. Really, really intuitive, brother. Meow. Say All right, go on. I'm sorry. A development, uh -huh. so to speak, in spirals. Uh -huh. uh, I just read that. Not in a straight line, a, spasm a spasmodic, catastrophic, revolutionary development. Breaks of gradualness. Transformation of quantity into quality. All right, real Inner quick, impulses. real quick interruption. We will learn what quantity into quality means, just not yet. Go on. Inner impulses for de for development, imparted by the contradiction, the conflict of different forces and tendencies. I'm going to have to flip the page over. Reacting on a given body or inside a given phenomena or within a given society. Interdependence and the closest indissoluble connection between all sides of every phenomena really really thank you good job um really important stuff here right so um we we explained the the sort of contradiction thing right uh what i want to draw your attention to right now though is how he says um that they are within or imparted to a given body because these changes can be forced from without as well. Think about the national oppressions of colonized nations, right? And their struggle, which can align a national proletariat with a national bourgeoisie against the invading imperialist bourgeoisie. Think about the Chinese revolution, right? It overthrew a Japanese uh, invading force so just to remember that there is a, a few layers of this does anyone have any questions awesome okay so the next part is three the Sorry. materialist oh i had a question <laughs> yeah go ahead, just, go ahead. So, uh really quick would this also this kind of analysis also apply to um like the net we are we're responding to our own society but to the natural world as well so i don't know major uh disasters or you know like the the little ice age that took over europe and things like that are also a part of this as well murphy's pool your wife also likes the movie sweet november okay i'm not sure your wife is the best judgment but thank you for the super chat i appreciate it Oh, go ahead and ask them, Matthew. Go ahead. Why not? We've already devolved. We still have, guys. We ha we still have two hours left of this class, and we're already arguing about cats and dogs in the chat. We we've been streaming for two hours now. We have two hours left to go of this of this class. I need everyone. Let's just let, let's just let, 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 take a moment. Everyone, get up, stretch. Do a couple jumping jacks. I'm not going to do it because I'm plugged into my headphones and I don't want to mess up my my system. But everyone else do it that's not on the internet right now. I never want to do a couple deep breaths. Okay? We need to get our feelings about cats and dogs and dogs and cats out of our system. We need to refocus on the on the class in basics of Marxism that's right in front of us. And we need to get... We're getting through this together, guys. All right, let's keep going. Please mount that like button for me. Thank you. Hmm. Absolutely. Yes, nature is in a relationship itself with society in part and informs how this looks. Uh, and society itself is in turn part of nature. So there it's, yes, absolutely. A dynamic process. Yes, yes, yes. Any other questions? Uh, if not, why doesn't someone start reading part three? 
materialist conception of history. I can read unless someone else would like to that hasn't yet. I can go. Cheers. The materialist conception of history. Marx and Engels were the first to put the writing of history upon a scientific basis. I mean, stripping of the mass of metaphysics. Hang on, hang on. Matthew is exactly correct. In all seriousness, this is why the left wins. Despite their internal contradictions, they are better at staying focused. This really is depressing. It is. It's true, Matthew. It's true. I'm strongly considering doing mushrooms later. I don't know if socialism leading into mushrooms, though, is necessarily like the best idea I've ever had in the world. But it's been quite a week. Maybe. We'll see. We'll see. Physics, subjectivism, hero worship, class bias, and superficialities characterizing bourgeois-ridden history. All right, pause real quick. I just want to say go foster for putting history when it's talking about bourgeois versions of it in scare quotes. Because bourgeois versions of history, uh, I'm sure you've all taken history classes. What they do is have us memorize dates and events. We never really understand things. And we can't understand the actual scientific uh, process happening, right? We can't understand what really is creating phenomena within society because it defaults to idealism and hero worship, subjectivism, trying to read the minds of people that have been dead for 10, you know, a thousand years, a hundred years, however. Uh, sorry, keep going. The heart of the Marxist materialist conception of history lies in the economic factor. The way people make their living. Marx outlines it as follows. In the social production which men carry on, they enter into definite relationships that are indispensable and independent of their will. These relations of production correspond to a definite stage of development of the material powers of production. The sum total of these relations of production constitutes the economic structure of society, the real foundation on which rise legal and po political superstructures and to which correspond definite forms of social consciousness. The mode of production in material life determines the general character of the social, political, and spiritual processes of life. It is not the consciousness of men that determines their existence, but on the contrary, their social existence determines their consciousness. Thank you, brother. Um, that was great. This is one of the most uh, important lines that Marx ever wrote, right? What he's saying is that the way we go about producing the things that make society society creates the classes and how that society looks. And this changes over time as our uh, productive forces advance, as the mode of production advances, it must create new relations of production to go with it. Right? So, uh, the bourgeois relation that we talked about, uh, the pro, or I'm sorry, the bourgeois production that we talked about earlier outmoded the old feudal relation, right? And we're coming to a time now, even within the imperialist countries, where the bourgeois relations of production are being outmoded, that they no longer serve a purpose. And this is what creates the classes and how they change. Each class is only wrapped up with the way we do production. I would like some examples That's why of that. What does in he mean? Production, we had lords and peasants, right? In the slave owning empires, we had the property owners, the slaves, and the artisans. And now we have the bourgeoisie and proletariat. Now, we could overcomplicate that with going into the re proletariat, but we're not going to get there yet. Any questions about this? Massively important section. I, I would mm. like to talk about the significance of the internet, or what I like to call the informational revolution, mm. which is that it's it's made it very. Uh, one thing that the bourgeoisie has had over the proletariat throughout its uh, rule is uh, a form of literacy, and, and uh, the ability to read, the ability, and and now, uh, like you know, the the proletariat never had ways to communicate with itself. 
in ways that it does now. Just like, you know, during feudalism, when there wasn't factories, there was no proletariat to really be, it was mostly like peasantry, right? Um, that's kind of a, like... A, a, if they were all working in the factories, couldn't they have just talked while they were working in the factories? Isn't that a form of communication? Vince says, and here's where the whole blank slate comes into play. If the individual is a mere construct of society, then society has the right to shape individuals as it wishes. Of course, who decides? Well, that's always the key with socialism, isn't it? It's like, who is ultimately making the decisions? And they're going to say, the community will make the decisions. Okay, but that's not the way it works. And if you're talking about democracy, I, I reject that fundamentally because you're talking about 51% of the community being able to enforce their will on the 49%. And that doesn't strike me as very fair. I'm I'm choosing to ignore that for right now. King Peter of the chat. Autumn is working through some feelings that uh, that she has about James Lindsay, um, probably because she wants to you know sleep with him or something like that, um, and she just can't like wrap her head around that. But I'm I'm working my way through it. Don't worry about it. Serious question, Carlin. Do you think we'd have to manipulate conservatives into fighting back in a way that is effective instead of just being emotionally gratifying? how i don't i mean i am not i am not above emotion i am not above manipulating conservatives to be productive i'll i'll tell you i'll say that i will say that on the internet right now i am not about i am not above in any way shape or form playing mind games with conservatives to to get them to actually be productive and to do things that are productive I just don't know how to do it. I really don't because I don't. I'm sure there's a way to do it. I just don't know what that way is yet. So if you have ideas, White Wizard Alex, you you let me know. Another emerging changing of, of um, I guess, production or changing of society um, is, it seems like to me is the ability to inform each other now and exchange information like never before. Social media has kind of made reading almost fun, like, you know, to people who never would have read before. Like, cause it's, it's like, hey, read with your friends, like read what your friends have to say. Okay. And eventually we all start being like, well, there's a lot more to read besides what our friends have to say. And then we, you know, go read other things. I think this might've led to a large, um, interest in Marxism that came, you know, in the past few years or so, you know, um, is being more used to reading and, and getting a feel for reading, like in ways that have never happened before. Oh, in human for history. real. For, no, I that don't was wrong. think it's a coincidence. For real. Excuse for me. real. For real. Of seltzer. Um, I don't think it's a coincidence that we're doing this at a time when our condition. Beth, you are a smart conservative. Where, where can we find more people like you, Beth? <laughs> All right, fuck us, fuck us, fuck us. Sins are deteriorating like crazy, right? This impossibility of continuing on in the old way is arriving with an immediacy uh, never seen before. And the computer revolution or the technology revolution that creates the internet, creates AI and advanced algorithms changes everything. This is going on at the same time as changes in finance capital itself, which, I mean, this is later on. Uh, that's what capitalist social relations turn into is the monopoly cartels, right? So, uh, yeah, that was just really well said. Thank you for adding that. Anyone yeah, have any other questions? Of, yeah, I was going to say piggybacking off of what he just said. Um, the access to information. Um, I remember, uh, I remember, I forgot what I read, but it was something like where um, you were able to get like, uh, there was like one in like a thousand bourgeois thinkers, which was like Marx talking about like truly being able to interact and study the working class. And then you have like um, a member, like they called it like an advanced member of the proletariat who are able to really synthesize that and then deliver it to the people 
And then through things like the printing press, they were able to really um, like make that text available all the way. And they were talking about the Soviet Union. So all the way from like Azerbaijan to like the very Eastern tip of the Russian empire. And through that, they were able to really unify um, the entire sort of like Eurasian continent under this one ideology because they were able to distribute that information uh, very efficiently. Well said, brother. And that makes you think about the power within the internet if we can figure out a way to harness it, right? A lot, so, so many billions are spent by our enemy class, the bourgeoisie, by finance capital in trying to prevent that very thing from happening. Uh, the Midwestern Marx Institute is censored like crazy. They keep taking down our TikTok accounts, for example, which were getting videos with millions of views. People were receiving this information and that's dangerous for them. They need to do something about it. And it's not just us, it's done in a systemic way, in a technological way. And so what we need to do is figure out ways to overcome that. If they can do these things, we can too. But that's getting way ahead of ourselves. Um, Let's rein it back in because there is quite a bit more of. I the still think it's fascinating. We heard them talk about this last time too, that the, that big tech is censoring the socialists just as much as they are the conservatives, which to me says that it's just like more a tool of the establishment than, um than it is of like, you know, the, the right or the left. It's a tool of the establishment. Um, So I don't know. There's something to that. the uh essay to get to uh it looks like jay has a quick question though real quick sure go ahead brother oh yeah, right. yeah. yeah i had an issue with unmuting myself um not necessarily a question just a comment piggybacking off of the internet thing but if we need to move forward we, i can no, show that right. okay um i was just thinking about the internet as a type of mode of production revolution but it, I think more than just the internet now with robotics and AI, I think that's a big part of rehabilitation, like you talked about, um, because people like, you know, who went to college and have higher paying jobs have typically been safer and not had to worry about um, getting exploited as much. With, it, with AI, it's like, oh, you have a desk job and, you know, you, you push spreadsheets all day. You can automate that now. Um, and so a lot more people are, are being threatened it's not just like the workers in factories with robotics because that was happening throughout the 2000s um, but now it's you know the the pmcs it's the mental laborers and so i think that has a lot of potential to push us together and build more like more more class solidarity absolutely brother well said i think it's important to note that every uh revolution in history has arrived when a previously stable middle class began falling into instability. And this is exactly what uh, you were just describing, and that is reproletarianization. And people are thrust into these service jobs uh, that have no future, right? That no one forces uh, them leave to take us those in jobs. very undignified, oftentimes, uh, positions of having to uh, cater to the pompous whims of every Karen in the neighborhood, right? Literally, I no mean, I've worked to in food jobs. service and the way you're treated but sometimes is horrible. And it's just an undignified way. But beyond that, these jobs, because of AI, can all be automated now. Our, our productive forces are outmoding those relations of production. Something new must therefore come into being. And it's up to us to help bring that forward, to organize the working people. But that's, I mean, let's, I don't want to get into a whole uh, organizing conversation because that's a another thing. Let's keep going. I just wanted to say that was really. I think it's fabulous that AI is going to put so many of these people out of work because that will be motivation for them to go and actually develop a, a sellable skill. Shauna, thank you for the super chat. 
Oh God, Shauna. I went down a black hole on black nationalism and they were also being censored and they, they just think it was fragile light people. I mean, I think that just in general, like anything that's outside of the establishment view will always be, you know, censored on big tech. And I think that people see, like, I think that this is going to be controversial. I don't agree with censorship, but I also think that people spend so much time bitching and complaining about censorship when instead what they could be doing is accepting the rules of the game that they're playing and trying to find a way to work within those rules that's smart. Like so many people in the, and I see this all the time with like conservatives, especially like on Twitter or on YouTube, quite frankly, is they poke the bear. They do things just to see what they can get away with. They, they say things that they know are going to get them in trouble just for, to make the point of getting in trouble. They, they say the words that they know are going to get them banned, and they don't have any purpose to it other than to get banned. They just keep poking the bear, poking the bear, poking the bear, poking the bear. And it's like, okay, I understand you're making a point fine, but can we try to find a way to work within the system? Because this constant poking of the bear isn't accomplishing anything. It's only making things worse. It's only it was like it was like when Jordan Peterson refused to delete that one tweet on his account. And it's like, Jordan, you have millions of people that you can impact with your account. There's so much good you can do. And you're digging in your heels and not doing good work and not helping people because you're trying to get clout for being banned on Twitter when you're not really banned. Like you just need to delete a tweet. And it's like. I understand that it's unfair. I don't think it should be that way. But there are so many battles that we need to be fighting that if you're expending all your energy energy just like poking the bear of, of big tech, you're not going to have any energy left over for the other battles. And not only are you not going to have any energy left over, you're also not going to have the accounts you need to actually fight the bigger battles. Well, sure, some people, fine. But... How many people do we really need? Really well said, brother. Thank you. Um, just one thing, though, uh, from from what you explained here, uh, as well as uh, the whole thing with the Internet and, the, and, and as well as this paragraph, it basically sounds to me like the bourgeoisie really handed us the tool that will lead to their demise. Because if, uh, like for instance, it's like it's like giving us an ax and having us whack against a tree and every single time we whack against a tree an apple falls down and then they can collect the apple and eat it. But you know, uh, we keep whacking at that tree, the ax, and so eventually we will chop that tree and it will fall on top of their heads. The problem is, is that they don't realize that they're actually giving us that ax to chop the tree down to fall on top of their heads. And now they're starting to see, wait, stop whacking at that tree so hard because not only am I still getting my apples, but now you're endangering my life. And so that's what it looks like to me. Uh, I'm just thinking out loud here. Well, so I think they're very aware, uh, just as a little, you know, uh, a little argumentation, but. I think the the rest of what you said is just very insightful. And I, you know me, Jay, I say this to you all the time. You come up with things that Marx or Engels said and just put them in different words all on your own without having any like formal education in this, because that's what happens within the proletariat, right? We, the learning Marxism is like finally having the words to understand these things that we already knew all along. Um, but this one, Lenin has a great quote where he says that the capitalists will sell us the ropes that we hang them with. And that is absolutely the same as your tree chopping analogy. Um, but yeah, let's keep going. Who wants to read next? I can read it. Oh, go ahead, go ahead, sorry. Uh, Marxists have frequently been accused of laying sole stress upon the economic factor and of ignoring all others such as national traditions, history, culture, etc. But this is nonsense. In this respect, Engels combats vulgar economic determinism. 
He says, according uh, to the materialist conception of history, the determining element in history is ultimately the production and reproduction in real life. Real quick, more than ever. I just got to interrupt. Production and reproduction, that is something you'll see over and over again. What it means is our production, uh, how we engage in creating all the things that we need to survive that make society what it is, and then reproduction, which is the reproduction of society itself. That's the, the way biological all family. Of that happens are social connections. Uh, you'll hear me talk a lot about the proletariat and reproletariat being thrust into a role of only fulfilling social reproduction. And this is what I'm referencing. Go on, go on. I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, more than this, neither Marx nor I have ever asserted. If therefore somebody twists this into the statement that the economic element is the only determining one, he transforms it into a meaningless, abstract, and absurd phrase. Uh, phrase. Thank you. That's perfect example of this, right? When people talk about Oh, you Marxists are class reductionists. I'm sure everyone here has been called a class reductionist at some time or another. Bingo, Beth, congratulations. What we say instead is no, that's absolutely not what we are. What we are is class expansionists. So what? rather than speaking of the separation of things, we talk about, for example, in our particular situation, the black freedom struggle has been the primary mode and form that class struggle has taken on uh, in the most important times in our country's history, that being the Civil War, the Second Revolution, and then the Third Revolution, which was a political revolution that we call the Civil Rights Movement, right? And this was a they think that the Civil War was the second revolution and the Civil Rights Movement was the third revolution? I had not heard that before. That makes, um, I mean, from a Marxist point of view, I suppose that makes sense. Socially and materially determined form uh, of the class struggle, particular to those material characteristics that created it right and so this covers it and it's not actually the economic factor but the underlying analysis is class analysis it is the dialectical materialist worldview any so, questions about that i know that's a lot to throw at you well no because uh this i think this is i think this is good because for those of us who are in the black community like myself we can take being black and link it to class. Hell, I'm gay. I can take that and link that to class as well. Because we know that the prolet, I'm sorry, that, that the bourgeoisie uses the division in order to keep the classes apart. For instance, wow. we'll start saying things about LGBTQ people when in fact we should be talking about the people like the Elon Musks and the Harlan Crows and the people who run the IMF and the, and the Federal Reserve and the World Bank. So really, those two people are the enemies, but they will use this, this uh, kind of a, a re reduce us to, you know, this person on this side and this person on this side is the reason why you don't have a job or is the reason why, you know, things are, you know, going bad for you in your life. But in reality, it's really the bourgeoisie that's the problem. And so using a class analysis that actually shows that, a working class, you know, black guy like me doesn't really have that much difference than someone who is white working class who is in Appalachia. Right. That's absolutely it, they're just different forms of the class struggle created by the particularity of that situation, right? Um there I mean there's sort of a Within our ruling class, there's a Democrat and Republican side, right? If these people ever actually figure out how to talk to working class like Trump voters, which, and I've said this for years, I think that these people like and like BLM activists, like normal BLM people, have much more in common with like working class MAGA people than either of those groups have with the establishment. And if these people 
ever actually figure out how to talk to working class MAGA people, we 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 are really effed then. Now they won't do that right now because they're afraid of them. They think they're racist. They think like all this stuff. They've they've spread so many lies about these people to like, you know, demonize them and all that stuff. So they're not actually going to do that just now. And and God knows working class MAGA people are never going to approach them. But if they ever actually figure this out and it's an idea that they're waffling around, then we are really, really effed because working class MAGA people want to be led by someone. They want someone to tell them what to do. They want someone to tell them where to go. They want someone to tell them, I will fix all your problems. You don't have to worry about it. They're not there yet, but if they ever figure it out, we are really in trouble. And they both have versions of this. And both of them uh, push people away from class. So there is uh, what's commonly referred to as the social reactionary position of, you know, LGBT people or black people or whoever it is, they say are just, you know, their interests conflict with everyone else's and people who aren't black or LGBT or whatever else. And you, it's you guys that need to battle it out between each other. Whereas uh, the Democrat version would be like, oh, we just need a couple, you know, uh, we just need representation within our bourgeois government. Oh, sure. Or I think you could. institutions yeah. or whatever Absolutely. it is. Absolutely. As if that does anything for the masses within that community. Right? Um, and this is why viewing this as through the Marxist method for, for me, for us at the Institute is the only way to really uh, understand the material significance of these particular forms of struggle. Um, but yeah, I don't want to go up into a big thing. We've been going on for a while. We got to keep, keep it focused. So let, that was well said though. It was much needed to add. Uh, let's keep going though. I can continue reading. Absolutely. Or, okay. Uh, and then just a great way to summarize that last paragraph is that the vulgar economic determinists are diametrically opposed to the those who have a materialist conception of history. Because for those who have the materialist conception of history, production and reproduction is the ultimately determining factor. Mm. The key, the ultimate determining factor, whereas the vulgar economic determinists say, it is, or say, we say, that is the determining factor. And that's, you know, that's it. That uh, it doesn't create any more factors is what they think. Uh, which correct. obviously and us materialists. Is, and if you read the letter this is from that Engels wrote, I think it's to someone named Block, B-L-O-C-H. Uh, don't quote me on that, though. It's, my memory is bad. Um, he actually explains that if if you were to actually view things this way, you're looking at the entire world in a very silly way, a very childish way. Uh, and so that, anyway, go ahead, go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> You're good. Okay, uh, so continuing on beginning with the bourgeoisie, correct? Yep. Awesome. The bourgeoisie with its idealistic, eclectic system of history writing, which denies causation and reason and puts the stress upon all sorts of secondary and superficial elements, has no clear picture of past history, nor of what is happening at the present time. Real quick, historical materialism. We, real quick, gonna interrupt. Just remember what we said about memorization of dates and names, etc. This is what he's referring to. Go ahead. Historical materialism, the method of Marx, with its stress on the economic factor, with its stress on the economic factor, gives to Marxists a decisive advantage in drawing the elementary lessons from past history and for understanding the fundamental meaning of the complex economic and political processes of today. It is this that enables Marxists to foresee the inevitability of social revolution and socialism an eventuality which the bourgeois economists and historians neither can nor dare envisage. 
I mean, that's Indeed. we already we already went over that one, right? Talk about uh, uh, seeing into the future there and uh, giving us the tools to uh, foresee things that, excuse me, that we even talked about the inevitability of social revolution and socialism. And just a quick uh, sort of glossary, like uh, definitions, well, definitions is not the word, but um, social revolution is the total transformation of society. Whereas when I mentioned earlier, the civil rights movement is a political revolution, it changed everything from a political level, right? MLK's movement was a political revolution that ended up changing our basic social relations in the USA forever. Uh, yeah. Uh, the next section, however, is the class struggle. Uh, I have to go out and do one more thing for my family. So why doesn't someone begin uh, with part four of the class struggle? And I'll be right back. I got it. The class struggle. The Communist Manifesto thus states the fundamental Marxist position on class struggle, the class struggle. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. Free man and slave, patrician and plebeian, lord and serf, guild master and journeyman, in a word, oppressor and oppressed stood in constant opposition to one another, carried on an uninterrupted, now hidden, now open fight, a fight that each time ended either in a revolutionary reconstruction, reconstitution of society at large or in the common ruin of the contending classes. In the earlier epochs of history, we find almost everywhere a complicated arrangement of society into various orders, a manifold gradation of social rank. In ancient Rome, we have patricians, knights, plebeians, slaves. In the Middle Ages, feudal lords, vassals, guildmasters, journeymen, apprentices, serfs. In almost all these classes, again, subordinate gradations. The modern bourgeois society that has sprouted from the ruins of feudal society has not done away with class antagonism. It has but established new classes, new forms of struggle in place of the old ones. All right. Thank you. That is that ties it all together, right? Uh, the only oh, thing yeah, that makes it all is clear this comes from the manifesto, right? Uh, which was a, a basically written as propaganda. It was meant to spur on our feelings and stuff. So rather than Oppressor and oppressed, on, a more uh, on, scientific on, on the, on the view. Well, this is the case, don't get me wrong. A more scientific view would be new and old, right? The new thing, the oppressed overtaking that oppressor. Uh, anyone have any questions about this section, though? I'd like to um, tie in, if I can, the, uh, the importance of the dialectic uh, according to um, when you see like the the in our society today, there's like this uh, material dominance by the corporations over a like a pseudo dialect, which is um, that between the Republicans and the Democrats. And it's not really a because, you know, a dialectic is like or is, is when, you know, two sides collide, creating a like a, a different outcome or, um, you know, in argument sense, it like sharpens each other's arguments. Right. And it seems like that the corporations look to slow down that dialectic by applying pseudo dialectic between these two um, not very objective sides. Like uh, as we were talking about earlier, you know, like the Democrats and their performative um, symbolism and the evading of any material conditions and what they do. And then here comes like Fox news saying like, Oh, it's, it's, they're being woke and they're like casting a spell and that's making our economy bad. <laughs> and so, you know, look, this is how bad our economy is because they keep uh, doing this, like symbolist stuff, you know, and it's like nobody's really buying that. Like nobody in reality is buying that, but they make the illusion that that's what society is, is, is the real dialectic in our society. I think, you know, like, and then tying in what the internet is and the material conditions changing, I think that's allowed for people to um, communicate new ways besides the pseudo dialectic 
and instead engages in a dialectic with that pseudo dialectic that you know is divided and weak and and not really based on material objective reality and so it can destroy it you know it can it can you know uh really do away with that old dialectic it's almost like that pseudo dialectic always has to adopt to the more materialist dialectic that's going on among people who are being sincere and aren't under the control of like corporate uh, sponsorships or lobbyism you know very very well said absolutely he's making me think of what comes in the next paragraph which is the discussion about uh the bourgeois class being anxious to obscure the class character of the internal struggles taking place Absolutely. And Foster was writing this, remember, during the beginning era of the American middle classes. He was an American communist, right? Um, and he led our party for quite some time. Actually, he did some very heroic things that we can maybe discuss after class. Um, but this is what he's referring to, right? The attempt to paper over the contradictions uh, rather than our job, which is to disclose those contradictions and develop them into what we'll learn about later, the negation and negation of the negation. Uh, but yeah, very well said. All right. I'm going to read the next part. Um, I just feel like reading. So <laughs> before Marx's time, Many bourgeois historians and political economists, including James Madison in the U.S., uh, and actually a lot of uh, the Sons of Liberty, had gained some inkling of the class struggle. But it was Marx and Engels who made the whole vital matter crystal clear. In a letter to Wedemeyer, uh, Marx said on this question, and now as to myself, no credit is due me, excuse me, for discovering the existence of classes in modern society, nor yet the struggle between them. Long before me, bourgeois historians had described the historical development of this class struggle and bourgeois economists, the economic anatomy of the classes. What I did that was new was to prove, one, that the existence of classes is only bound up with particular historic phases in the development of production. Uh, I think it's funny he says A next rather than two, but A, that the class struggle necessarily leads to the dictatorship of the proletariat, and back to three, that this dictatorship itself only constitutes the transition to the abolition of all classes and to a classless society, which is a very modest summary indeed of Marx's contributions on this central question. So what is he saying here, right? He's saying that it's all about that motion, right? Different forms of uh, essential phenomenon occurring in particular situations on higher and higher stages of development, right? That's what he's going over. Now, we'll get to um, the unique character that is the creation of the proletariat and why the proletariat, uh, its class interests represent the, cla the interests of all of humanity uh, in a bit. Uh, well, actually, I think next. But yeah, just, just to let you know, um, anyone who doesn't know about what the dictatorship of the proletariat is either, basically the Marxist view is that all class society is the dictatorship of one class over another, right? The oppressed and oppressor. So the dictatorship of finance capital that we're in now sees a sort of democracy form within their class, but it is dictatorial to our class. We have no power within this system until we organize ourselves and take it, creating our own system, right? Um, but yeah, go on with uh, number five, whoever wants to read. Oh, sorry, does anyone have any questions before that? Great, great, great. Go on with pot. I can read it. The revolutionary role of the working class in his analysis of the class struggle, Marx, as one of his greatest achievements, developed a revolutionary role of the proletariat. In the Communist Manifesto, he said, of all the classes that stand face to face with the bourgeoisie today, proletariat alone 
is a really revolutionary class. The other classes decay, I'm sorry, the other classes decay and finally disappear in the face of modern industry. The proletariat is its special and essential product. All right, let's stop real quick. Remember earlier we were talking about the peasantry being proletarianized? This is what he's referring to, right? The proletariat, however, comes into being specifically because of the forces of production in capitalist society, in bourgeois society. The bourgeoisie as a class must create the proletariat. You need a mass of people to work on all of these new, more advanced uh, means of production, right? Uh, go on, Jay. The lower middle class, the small manufacturer, the shopkeeper, the artisan, the peasant, all these fight against the bourgeoisie to save themselves from extinction as fractions of the middle class. They are therefore not revolutionary, but conservative. Nay, what? more, they are reactionary. Marx was here uh, dealing with the period of competitive capitalism. In the period of imperialism, however, the era of the general crisis of capitalism, the proletariat is able to mobilize the poorer peasantry and other petty bourgeoisie elements behind its leadership. To theorize the worker peasant alliance was one of the greatest achievements of Lenin. All right, let's go over this because it's very important to understand because it is one of the reasons we call this Marxism Leninism, right? Um, imperialism comes around and it basically gives us two questions the national question of every country and the international question, right? So that's one. And then the other is these peasants that were being proletarianized. Um, as I was just saying, find alliance with the proletariat. And this is actually an extension of Marx um, because the proletariat represents the interests of all of humanity, right? It is these class interests that can rally everyone to its side. And even in our era, the proletariat properly organized can rally the re-proletariat to its side, just as um, the Russian proletariat like organized and rallied their lower middle classes, right? We do the same with ours. And this is part of what re-proletarianization is about, but I'm basically just giving you different particularities of the same essential phenomenon that Lenin was talking about here. Um, I think a really good, oh my bad. I think a really good manifestation of this entire paragraph is like today where you, like when you're in public and you're talking to people who are of the middle class or who have like, you know, middle-class jobs and things like that, they'll always ask you like, uh, or, or they'll always talk about how like, like if we have a revolution, like I'm, they try to say like, they're, they're our enemy. Um, like the middle class is somehow the enemy of 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 the working class, and in in certain ways it is because of its reactionary nature. Um, however, it is, I feel like um, when people say that, it's our job to sort of convince them that your best interest sort of lies with us and not with them, because eventually they're going to want what you have and kind of conglomerate you, what you have, your little shop, your little market, into the broader market, and then you're just going to join us one way or the other. That's a really good point, and it uh, references the materiality of middle class interests, which Marx was just talking about, right? Their class interests lie in the past. This is why he says, nay, they're reactionary, right? So seeking to preserve the current order, that happens within our middle classes right now. And Lenin comes along and sort of uh, explains how Middle classes in different sections, depending on their like the higher or lower end, um, they waffle back and forth. Uh, one day they'll be with us, another day they'll be with the bourgeoisie. And so this is one of the reasons the proletariat must leap, right? Uh, with ours, think about sort of uh, the PMC types who 
join leftist organizations, do whatever, but they insist on their social atmosphere driving uh, regular working class people away, right? Doing the work of the bourgeoisie, even when they believe they're being revolutionary. This is their class interest coming out despite anything they may say, which lies with the bourgeoisie, right? It lies in preservation of the current order. Uh, th that's getting into the weeds a little bit, but just to give you an example of how it happens. So if you don't want to completely revolutionize society and turn everything on its head, then you are not on their team. That's what they're saying. They're like, these people might, you know, they might theoretically know that their interests lie with us. They might even they might even claim to be one of us, but at the end of the day, they just don't want to do what's required to completely revolutionize society. They don't want to turn everything and then really they're still they're still aligned with the bourgeoisie. It's in our day right now. Just the question, though, doesn't this also mean from what you describe as reproletarianization that they will, you know, through that process, they really will have no choice but to side with us because, and, and a lot of people say this, is that, the, that there is no more middle class. And we see how capitalism pushes away middle class because they, they, they made concessions back then, especially like during the Industrial Revolution and into the, uh, they, they did it during the Great Depression, where they had to give concessions in order to have a middle class so that they won't be destroyed. And so now, from what it seems like to me is that the bourgeoisie is clawing back all the gains that the middle class has had. And so they're saying, you know what, no, we, we, you guys had that for about a good 75 years. We don't want you guys to have that anymore. We're taking it all back. And so now the middle class is going, wait a minute. Um, they're taking back the stuff that we had, like the, you know, the suburbs and the nice car and the house. And so now they're realizing, oh, we're actually really are part of the proletariat. That's what it feels like. Absolutely. And remember earlier when we that. mentioned every revolution in history. And if they really think they're part of the proletariat, it's because they don't know what the proletariat means. Loses that status, loses that stability loses that stable way of life. And that's precisely what's happening. My paper on the reproletarianization process, the subtitle is The Life and Death of the American Middle Classes, right? So it describes their arising and then their fall. And that's precisely what's happening now. The process of uh, financial capitalism has forced this on them. The class interests of finance capital stand in direct contradiction with the re-proletariat as well as the proletariat. So it's this new thing coming into being, uh, and it's nothing but opportunity for us, just like in Lenin's day, organizing what he called the democratic petty bourgeoisie, which, by the way, he also it's criticized, don't get me wrong. Um, we can reap, we can organize with the re-proletariat. A proletariat, uh, we're going to get way off into the reeds. But yes, absolutely, Jay. Well said. Uh, let's go into the next bit of this, though. Um, Lenin says, the main thing in the teaching of Marx, or that's where we're at, right? I just want to yes. make sure. Yeah, okay. Lenin says, the main thing in the teaching of Marx is the elucidation of the worldwide historical role of the proletariat as the builder of a socialist society. We've said this a few times, right? This firm Marxian insistence upon the leadership of the proletariat is fundamental to revolutionary working class policy. Marx's clarity on this has successfully countered persistent attempts of various schools of opportunists to see in the bourgeoisie, the peasantry, or the city, city petty bourgeoisie, the constructive class that the masses of workers should follow. Cough, cough, PMCs. The leading role of the working class was the key to winning of the future great revolutions in Russia, China, and Eastern Europe. 
continuing on real quick, already in the Communist Manifesto, Marx also began to outline the special type of thinking, fighting, disciplined party necessary for the working class to win finally over the capitalist class. The communists, he says, are on the one hand, practically the most advanced and resolute section of the working class parties in every country, that section which pushes forward all others. On the other hand, theoretically, they have over the great mass of the proletariat the advantage of clearly understanding the line of march, the conditions, and the ultimate general results of the proletarian movement, which means the creation of this revolutionary party um, and, and I understand this can make it almost seem as if it's looking down on the, the, the proletariat as not as advanced, but what it is instead saying is this party, when it becomes the revolutionary party of the working class, has already won its support. And so it can focus on the scientific understanding that creates a political lie that creates the revolutionary way forward, or what Foster always called the line of march. Uh, are there any questions about this? Um, something like a good, an example of how this played out is to see if you study the reaction of communism, especially in the States. Billions of dollars had to get poured into Red Scare, anti-commie, uh, advertisements like if you watch those documentaries and cartoons that they had i mean all that costs a lot of money you have to have writers editors animators all these different things they had huge apparatus i apparatuses that devoted to just that one thing so you could they're see pushing for socialism for everyone quote, that section which pushes for all others i mean you had mccarthyism so it went all the way into the federal government thank you murphy's pool as we know the ruling class wouldn't accept such a movement but that's just, you know, further evidence that this type of movement will spawn such a large reaction. So it's it's also pretty scary to see what that reaction will look like for our upcoming, you know, revolution. We see like in Florida already where we're no longer welcome. Uh, what? <laughs> as if we didn't already know. But, uh, you know, that it starts out with stuff like that, with just saying. Things and then, but anyways, that's just some evidence. It's also very important to remember there are overt forms of this and covert ones where rather than say communists are all evil, what they do is they take our language, they take the word communist, uh, Marxist, socialist, and give us just bourgeois ideology, just liberalism, but using the word communism so that any radical um, momentum is then recuperated by the ruling class. Think of our buddy Vish that uh, Eddie just annihilated in a debate, right? He is a perfect example of that. Vosh. Vosh. When he said Vish, he meant Vosh. Apparently, one of the socialists on Midwestern Marx debated Vosh. And according to the socialists, he annihilated Vosh. I don't know. Autumn, can you tell us if that's true? I somehow doubt that that's true, but I think it's it's interesting that they don't like Vosh. Funneling people into this sort of phony left that actually is incredibly reactionary the way Marx just described. Autumn, how does Vosh feel about the real socialists not liking him? Can you give us a rundown of what actually happened on the debate with Vosh so I don't have to watch it? That'd be really helpful, Autumn. I'd appreciate it. Right? Um, that's important to remember as well. Are, are there any other questions on this or comments? Yeah, I just wanted to speak really quickly on the uh, con conscripting Marxist language and applying it to... Um, non-revolutionary or just non-Marxist ideas. Um, I read, I like skimmed through some conservative books bit like that were talking on Marxism um, and they were trying to like conflate what? both um, like woke wokeism as Marxism, um, is Marxism. Theory as Marxism and as well as I wonder if he read my um, book. 
play the Democrat Party and Biden as Marxists. Um, and well, are- if they if they're equating the Democrats and 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 Biden with Marxists, that's dumb because Marxists hate the Democratic Party and they hate Joe Biden. So, but I do wonder what books he he read that are that are talking about such things. But if you're if you're telling me that critical race theory isn't from Marxism, bro, come on. Don't don't bullshit a bullshitter. I know your ideology better than you do. They're like large books written by really well respected like co- like conservative writers. Who? And like in the first chapter, they're like, yes, Barton's a Marxist. Um, everyone who's no, in you know true. the schools and universities is are Marxists. Yes, and that's the word true. just loses all meaning. That's true. Yeah, no, I'm <laughs> talking about American Marxists by Mark Levin. That's the book. Ah, <laughs> there it is, Mark Levin. <laughs> Mark Levin. I thought you were. That's amazing. Yeah. Mark Levin. Mar- of course, Mark Levin would think that Biden is a Marxist because Mark Levin has a conservative audience to appeal to. No offense, conservatives. Let's see. Autumn says, if my chat wants to connect, Vosh doesn't like these guys. He calls them tankies and they call him a shit lib. Think of it like this. They see Vosh how MAGA sees dinos like Mitt Romney. I mean, I think that that makes sense. I mean, I think that can we all, Autumn, can we come to some sort of agreement that Vosh is not really a socialist? Like, we agree on that, right? We have to have some common ground here. It's so wild because all you have to do is open something like this and you go, oh, they are clearly lying to me, <laughs> right? Like, they, it couldn't be any further from the truth. I it agree that Mark that Levin doesn't know what he's talking about. Believe things. Now, that said, more and more and more and more every single day, I almost swore I stopped myself, um, every single day. I definitely agree with that. People are waking that. up to that. People are going, let me see Excellent. if this we is all agree that Bosch is not a socialist. You gotta start and finding somewhere. Out it's not, right? Uh, as I often say, don't ever let anybody tell you what time it is. You can get yourself a watch. You can tell time for yourself. All of us, all of us are smart enough to pick this up and understand it. Can I say uh you know, one thing we see is uh, like how alienable ideology can be among a, a mass group of people and that really what ideology kind of comes down to is somebody's consciousness, you know, and so collective, it's like a collective consciousness. Should we watch the debate between on. Bosch and the social And like, I, I want to give a, and like, you know, talking about I'm not opposed. Understanding the different working classes and, and, you know, behind the proletariat or also the as the capitalism goes on, there is this thing where, um, in the Paris Commune, where the Thiers government created the rules, you know, which like streamlined like ignorant peasant masses to politically oppose the city and come in as like militants to polo- to oppose this like really politically conscious movement in the city, which was uh, the Paris Commune. Lenin realized this. He realized the need for an alliance between the proletariat and the peasantry. It had to be like, you know, theoretically examined and identified. But then, you know, from here, you, that, that's where the hammer and the sickle come from and the alliance between the peasantry and the proletariat in Russia. But you skip forward all the way to 2020, you know, after the Cold War, after the U.S. goes under this Cold War and all these books are being censored and there's no Internet to, to come in and show what Marxism really is. You, you know, you get to 2020 and there's this thing that Nitwitz, happens Bosch in this unrest during 2020 <laughs> where, you know, there's like 20, Harvard estimates 26 million people come out to the cities and, you know, where there's still in the city a lot more hang on hang on Bosch supports nato i am non-interventionist i don't think we have any business over there and i think nato should be abolished so Bosch yet again showing his uh his establishment shill bona fides i will absolutely agree with the real socialists over Bosch. um forward like a lot more political consciousness, a lot more cultural consciousness, but yet a, a phenomenon occurs that wasn't even identified by any of the, the the movement or any of the I guess the the leftist movement was that within small cities across the whole the whole country, 
they also began having demonstrations in cities they had never had this kind of thing before but there had never been any political you know small rural towns of like four thousand people and it kind of did it on its own and i think what that was was capitalism you know removing the peasantry you know removing the old feudal backward nature of it and now there's has emerged a what we have in capitalism that we never had before is this rural proletariat this rural industrial proletariat <laughs> whose class conditions like naturally align it with this progressive sentiment in the city that doesn't have to be explained ideologically even though they all are like they don't know what lenin did they don't know the significance of that everybody kind of just spontaneously did it you know mm. i think um I think that's the uh, uh, important thing of understanding, uh, yeah, the, you know, the, like, oh, even after the Cold War, as class conditions, you know, still changed, as Marx predicted, we're still, like, kind of right here on the same page spontaneously, something that we don't even have to theoretically identify, you know, like Lenin had to, I guess, you know, where these people are going to be more susceptible to being explained Marxist because of their, um, how the, the rural, sit like, towns have been proletarized, you know? been turning the like from peasant to proletariat i guess i think that's absolutely absolutely brilliant brother and here's one more contributing factor i just want to piggyback on that because it was so good one of the biggest ways our ruling class has kept us uh from um doing just this has been racism seriously right? how do you a define lot of racism? those rural towns wouldn't have ever how do you define uh, it spontaneously rose up for a black man in the past but after the political revolution of the civil rights movement that barrier begins eroding now our general form of social interaction is one not of racism not of overt racism but of the american people being closer together than ever more the American people rather than divided communities than ever and less racist than ever in our history. And I think that's a large contributing factor that in the past held all of these people back and now is no longer there. And the last thing I'll say on it, the job of a communist party is to go and organize these, to make sure any of these spontaneous movements of the working people of the proletariat and reproletariat in our circumstance doesn't fizzle out to push it all in a revolutionary direction to make sure we're networked and connected and focused on a real concrete goal but that's getting a bit ahead of ourselves uh we have a couple more sections to go uh i just wanted to say that was awesome let's continue on with uh section six now which is surplus value. Who wants to read? Go for it, brother. All right, section six, surplus value. Thanks, American In the early Legend. progressive oh, stage thanks, of American capitalism, Legend, I appreciate the bourgeois you. economists, Adam Smith, David Ricardo, John Stuart Mill, and many others made much sound analysis of that system, but they could not face up to the revolutionary realities of where capitalism was heading. And in later generations, bourgeois uh, economics degenerated eventually into little better than superficial apologetics for capitalism. As they we all see Marx. right now, right? <laughs> it remained for Marx the giant of all. It remained for Marx the giant of all economists to drive home the economic analysis to its revolutionary conclusions. Especially in his great three-volume work, Capital, Marx made a found analysis of the capitalist system. Among his innumerable basic contributions, he explained the hitherto unsolved questions of the primitive accumulation of capital, the cause of cyclical crises, the concentration of capital, and the many aspects of capitalism hitherto unprobed or obscured by bourgeois economists. But his supreme contribution in the economic sphere was to describe the production of surplus value by the workers and its appropriation by the capitalists. This laid bare the whole process of capitalist exploitation and exposed the economic causes leading to the proletarian revolution. Since then, countless bourgeois economists have tried in vain to refute his historic discovery. Mirroring, uh, I'm not sure what that word is. Uh, 
This Mary. sums up the sense it's of marrying, by the way. Marrying, okay, gotcha. I was wondering if that was a typo. No, marrying no, does term... Ah, there you go, there you go. Marrying thus sums up hit, uh, this central phase of Marxist theory. And I can keep reading if you want me to. I think so, yeah, because we're really building to something here. Go for it. The real source of capitalist wealth was revealed for the first time in the first volume of Capital. Marx showed for the first time how profit originated and how it flowed into the pockets of the capitalists. He did so on the basis of two decisive economic facts. First, that the mass of the workers consists of proletarians who are compelled to sell their labor power as a commodity in order to exist. And secondly, that this commodity, labor power, possesses such a high degree of productivity in our own day that it is able to produce a certain time uh, in a certain time, a much greater product than is necessary for its own maintenance in that time. These two purely economic facts, representing the result of objective historical development, cause the fruit of the labor power of the proletarian to fall automatically into the lap of the capitalist and to accumulate with the, count, with the continuance of the wage system into ever-growing masses of capital. All right, now let's go into this a little bit in more basic terms. Surplus value. When these industrial capitalists are creating a commodity, right? They must uh, purchase, they must own the means of production, obviously, and purchase materials, right? Within all of these materials to create the commodity that they want to sell is what he just called labor power, right? Or the work. Now, he pays a sum total for all of this, right? The commodity that he creates is higher than that entire total, right? So the difference between the value of that commodity realized in currency or what we call the commodity form and what he pays for the wages is what we call surplus value. It's the value over and above what what it took to create that thing and the wages that uh pay the workers for that labor so that labor is what's creating value itself Duh. but is adding new value into the equation right where there are all kinds of value already there within the material the labor that they are selling for an agreed upon salary autumn this is not the own you think it is like people you people learn this in high school and business class in order to run a business in order to grow a business in order for a business to be worth investing the initial money in to get started you need to create value in some way The labor does not create the value. The worker says, I will come and perform a task for you in exchange for which you will pay me a salary that everyone agrees upon. If the person paying that salary can then turn around and sell whatever product has has been created product service what have you as a result of all of it then the business will be successful and the business can grow labor is an expense just because you sell your labor for a salary voluntarily does not mean that you are entitled to own the products that you create because that was not a part of the initial bargain. Materials. And then the labor is the only thing adding more value no. to it than everything else. Um, no, I'm, 
One question or one sort of thought I had about that is the surplus value. Uh, the idea of true cost economics and how that kind of plays in, because I think you do have like the cost of the materials and everything for the production, and then you have the labor value going in. But certainly in our modern system, it's certainly, I, I think, at the time of industrialization, there's also costs that are never paid by anyone, like the environmental costs. You know, if your factory pollutes a river, that really doesn't increase your cost of production or of labor, but it's a cost that has to get paid somewhere. And it's well, also fact, a value yeah. that's absorbed, right? In fact, polluting often makes it cheaper for them. They're polluting because it's cheaper to produce in that polluting way than it would be to update their equipment with modern, uh, you know, more environmentally friendly standards, et cetera. Or they're, you know, dumping hazardous, hazardous waste. Uh, Cleveland, the city I'm from, is famous because our main... Well, has anyone ever held a gun to your head and forced you to work a job? Has anyone ever changed you to a cash, re a cash register and forced you to check people out? No, it is voluntary. If you don't want to work a job, don't work it. But don't complain when you don't have money if you don't want to work a job. The river was so polluted that it caught on fire. And that's because it was cheaper for them to produce in this way that created all of these negative effects felt by all of society than it was in a cleaner way that wouldn't have done that. We literally have everything here called burning river this, burning river that, because of that. And that's a really good point to add. So thank you for that. Uh, um, does anyone have any that, questions about surplus value, though? Uh, I didn't have a question, but I had something to say about uh, surplus value. Um, yeah, sure. Last or my senior year during my seminar course, we actually read a little bit of capital where surplus values talked about in the formulas, MCM and all those are brought up. Um, and I would recommend that if you're going to talk with anybody that's either apprehensive or just unaware of Marxism is surplus value is a fantastic place to start from simply with asking them, how do you get from a lemonade stand or a coffee stand to a coffee shop? How do you generate that wealth or generate that capital to get there? And then once someone understands that, they can just see it for every type Hang of on. business. We have, a, we have a critically important question from Heather. Did I watch the, the royal wedding in Jordan last week? No, I did not watch it, but I saw many, many videos of it, and it looked beautiful and lovely, and it makes me want to go to Jordan, and it looks so nice. And, and they had a parade down the road. Where they made the 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 Jordanian flag out of out of people marching and a jeep and it was so great, and the dresses were beautiful. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to relive that, Heather. I appreciate it. That's capitalism right there, baby. <laughs> No, Steve, the answer is you have never been had a gun to hold to your head and forced to work a job. That's never happened because it's voluntary. Just because you don't want to do it doesn't mean you're being forced to do it. This they a counter. So when you have, uh, I haven't really read Gramsci, but I think he calls it like those kernels or something like that. Uh, yeah, that yeah. you tap into surplus value is great. Uh, subject for that. They're kernels that we re-articulate, right, in, in the direction of socialism and class consciousness. And to answer the question that, that you just absolutely brilliantly raised, brother. Um, oh, God, we still have another fucking hour of this. I don't know if I'm going to make it through this. I don't know if I'm going to be able to do. I oh, God, thank God I have another beer. Hang on. OK. What do they do to go from that that, you know, small coffee stand to a this giant was, this was misguided it was a horrible idea to go three hour class less than they're bringing in and getting rich off them doing the work instead right um i often put it like this every cash register i ever go to and anyone who's familiar with uh the live streams that i'll sometimes come in on 
uh, knows this story. Every cash register I ever go to, I have the same interaction. They go, hey, how you doing? And I go, I am tired as hell. How about you? And they go, yep, uh, me too, man, me too. And I go, well, that's what happens when they got us spending eight hours a day making other people rich. Then don't do and it. That's Start your own business. That's the of these kernels of thought. Start your that, own business, uh, You were just then. talking about. So, yeah. Start your own um, coffee shop. And are there any questions? Anyone who feels like they don't, they're not 100% on what surplus value is? Oh, sorry, just to... And then getting to uh, to tag on what Noah said, another example of that is I commute a lot in the community and I'm parked next to delivery truck drivers from FedEx, UPS, mostly Amazon now. And you'll see them sweat and sweat. And then so I'll be parked at the light and I said, do you oh have an God, AC in there? Work? And they're like, no, oh we don't have them. And I ask them, why, why is it that you don't have an AC? I have one in my car. And then they'll start thinking, oh, it's a cost cutting measure. Well, why do they need to cut costs? They already make so much money. And then the questions just go from there. So it's, it could be as simple as, why are you so sweaty, bro? <laughs> you know, it really could start anywhere. So uh, just moving on. Do you guys know why some of the products are so expensive in my merch store? Because shipping costs money. And in order for me to have a merchandise store, it doesn't make sense for me to have a merchandise store where I am creating these products for you guys to buy. And then I have to pay for the creation of the products and I have to pay to have the products shipped to you. And then I, I actually end up losing money on the products because the shipping is so goddamn expensive. It is the way it goes. Things cost money. Shipping costs money. Production costs money people aren't going to do these things if there are not incentives for them to do it and you could say well these businesses are selling so much stuff they're making money hand over fist and blah 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 blah, blah. and so and so why don't they well i do have a, a shipping charge but it's really expensive like for example i'll give you guys an example of this i sold from my store 112 dollars worth of merchandise earlier today and do you know how much profit I made on that? 95 cents because of how it worked out with the things they selected and the different shipping options and the different things that had to be shipped. It, it cost me 40 effing dollars just to ship all the products out. And that's fine. That's the way it goes. I'm happy to do it. I didn't lose money. So that was, you know, a step in the, uh, that was a, you know, a positive step. But like the point I'm making is that things cost money. They cost money. And, and saying that, saying like, why don't you just cut costs? Like, why, 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 why don't you have to like, because that's the way the world works. It costs money to produce a product, to ship the product from point A to point B, to have that product come in like, you know, one piece so it's not broken. That's just the way it goes. Not everyone can reduce prices because like you're paying other people. And getting rid and, and, and putting the state in charge of the means of production is not actually going to solve anything because then you aren't going to have innovation. You aren't going to have people creating new products because there's no incentive for those products to be created. It's the way it goes. But you work it out. You keep trying. You don't just give up and say, oh, well, we might as well just turn into communism because I don't have air conditioning in my car. I mean, my God. It kills creativity. Yeah, exactly. Beth says, I owned a vending business. It took a year to break even. Yeah. If you want to be successful at a business, you have to work for it. But guess what, guys? It's doable. Anyone can do it. absolutely brother well said yeah so everybody um, okay. thinks they're, they're confident on surplus value or i would like to add uh, oh Go ahead. you cut out on us are you still there yeah i i'm still here 
Oh, no, no, not you, Jay. Somebody else was saying something. Oh. I wanted to add something. Yeah, absolutely. Go for it. Um, I think it's also important to add that you don't, you can't have super, uh, surplus, surplus uh, value without uh, work, without work of the workers. Even if you have a monopoly, which is automatized, it will fall eventually because it needs some kind of uh, um, innovation. And these innovations are made again with, uh, with uh, by making new uh, thoughts and then producing the things. And then you have these, I don't know, engineers or uh, um, computer scientists and so on like uh, for 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 um, artificial intelligence, for example, so you can't never get any kind of surplus value without exploiting uh, people by from their work. So I think this very very uh, necessary necessary to 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 say because um, the working people could also think or could be distracted by saying, "Yo, okay." Um, these people also make these innovations and uh, automatize their, their farms, or I don't know, uh, and so on, yeah. Yeah, that's a really, really important thing to, have, uh, to add. Thank you for that. I also think it's important to point out that uh, the capitalists aren't really the ones innovating. Think of Elon Musk. Did he design a single... SpaceX rocket? Nope. He takes credit for it, though. He acts as if he's some brilliant guy when really his only talent has been having a rich dad. That's it. Um, and then using his dad's money to invest in PayPal when it was young or whatever. Uh, but yeah, let's move on then to number seven, which is the role of the state. So he has a vision. He has Who wants leadership. To, uh, he takes risks. Off reading number seven. I'll go. He's willing to do things other go people aren't it. willing to do. <clears throat> the role of the state. One of the most basic elements of Marxism is Marx's analysis of the state as the instrument of force by which the bourgeoisie enforces the submission of the workers to its domination. The Communist Manifesto says. The executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. Give Mark me one Slash second. I'm going to interrupt you there. Sure. Think about that in relation to our, or wherever you are, parliamentary or electoral system. What they do is work out amongst themselves the affairs of the bourgeoisie. Every program that is massively popular with us, they don't care about. They could not care less about. Or at the uh, uh, the other option is they absolutely hate it and combat it on every level. Think about universal health care, which even Bernie's Medicare for all is a compromise away from, right? That still gives all our money to private insurance companies. They can't even do that because their electoral system is a is a committee for working out their affairs between themselves. Go ahead. I'm sorry to interrupt. Go ahead. No problem. Uh, Marx slashed into those muddleheads and opportunists who held that the capitalist state was an institution standing apart from and above all economic classes, concerning itself with the welfare of all the people. Marx and uh, Engels. I'm so traced sorry. Let me interrupt real quick. Now, mm -hmm. the people talk about the welfare state, social democracy, etc. You'll notice that all of these things are only put in, in place when the proletariat or the working masses have organized and forced them, right? The eight-hour day in the U.S., for example. No, Autumn. Those are called contracts. Contracts. They are providing services or products or both to the government and in return the government is giving them money 
Now, if you want to talk about doing away with all corporate subsidies, I am completely in favor of that. I don't think we should be subsidizing anything. But what you are talking about are contracts. Was forced into place by a militant communist party, labor struggle, trade unions, and even the IWW, which was sort of a collection of like uh, non-specific utopian socialists, right? All of these work together and force that into being the end of child labor, same deal, uh, creation of social security, all of these things, not to mention the existence of the Soviet Union, right? All of these were what forced these in the U.S. Never, ever have the bourgeoisie just given us things because they're magnanimous or seek to buy us off or anything of the sort. That isn't how the system operates. So, uh, yeah, continue on. Uh, can I say something real quick? Sure, sure, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to say real quick that that last bit you were saying about the existence of the Soviet Union. Um, I think that's one of the echoing effects of the Bolshevik Revolution was the fact that Europe no longer could uh, truly oppress and subjugate the European and the general proletariat because now they had um something to look at and say like we could literally be doing this so they had to give them the welfare state to sort of like tell them look just bear with us for a few more for a few more decades until we get to another inter-imperialist war it's also important to point out that that was only possible by the massive accumulation accomplished with the consolidation of the cartels and syndicates and trusts or finance capital Right. So imperialism itself lays the economic possibility for this. And then class struggle, both national in each country and international, uh, the existence of the Soviet Union that you just talked about, um, that forces it after that possibility. But yeah, that good thing to add. Thank you. Uh, but keep going on. Uh, Marx and Engels trace the history of the state, showing that with the rise of economic classes, the state ever served the interest of the ruling classes. Engels, especially in his The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, and in his anti during demonstrated that the victorious proletariat will ultimately do away with the state and relegate it into the Museum of Antiquities. All right. Now, this takes a little explaining because... Our first uh, thought is to go, oh, we're going to, you know, just have a revolution and then toss the state away like we're anarchists, right? But that isn't it. Oh, uh, what really? Marxism does instead is proves that, like everything else, the state goes from a lower stage to a higher. It develops and then undevelops. And the development of property and the creation of classes, that alienation we talk so you guys know how I keep saying these people are not anarchists. 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 He literally just said that. He's like, so so when you gain control and you have your little proletarian revolution, are you going to get rid of the state? No, we're not going to get rid of the state. When we have our proletarian revolution, we are evolving the state to its highest form. We're just evolving it. Let's listen again. Where we just go, okay, today we're going to shrink the state by X amount. That's not how things work, right? The proletariat must build itself a state that functions in the interests of the proletariat. So they're going to build, we're going to build our own state. We're not anarchists. We're, we don't want to get rid of the state. Every single time you guys hear these people say the state is the enemy. I want you to remember this and think back to this. The proletarian state has to evolve to protect the interests of the proletarian. The dictatorship of the proletariat, right? And after this, after 
we win the class struggle, right? This is when the state can wither away and become, mm. uh, and it no longer have a political character to it. Oh, sure. Which means yep. there is no more class struggle to be had, right? Because you control the it. The itself develops fully and overtakes the bourgeoisie who have undeveloped by this time. And the state transforms into just the administration of things for the people. Wow. Right? Um, in the Soviet Union. And then the state just, tra- the state is just administering things. It's not controlling you. It's not dictating how you live your life. It's just, the state is just pushing paperwork. All right. It's just paperwork. No one wants to do paperwork. You don't want to do it anyway. We'll we'll take care of all the paperwork and then you can go and be an artist or a poet or a musician because you're no longer going to be burdened with a job. You're not going to be burdened with responsibilities. You're going to be able to follow your bliss and, and the state is just going to administer it. And Nikita Khrushchev had a theory he called the state of the whole people. Now, it was ultimately wrong, but it was based on the notion that class struggle in the Soviet Union was over, right? That they everyone had proletarianized. Um, clearly, that wasn't the case, but that's neither here nor there. This is the process we're talking about happening. Uh, he had sort of the basics right, but got his conclusions wrong. Any questions? Um, this is, what you just said oh. is such a great, like, uh, I don't know, like, culmination of how people talk about communist China. Um, because I feel like some, uh, especially you see it in leftist circles, leftists just like want there to be a socialism button where, like, you just press it and all of a sudden society is in this ideal state. But that even is very anti-materialist because China itself is coming from basic feudalism, right? They had warlords. And to go from there to where they are now, um, you can't just be ideally dreaming of like socialism. It takes very hard, uh, very hard work and a lot of suffering to achieve the proper dictatorship of the proletariat. 100%. And this is why Lenin in the quote earlier said that this is glad we stuck with it guys it's a spasmodic catastrophic revolutionary transition that goes in spirals right that goes around and around bigger smaller whatever the class interests necessitate right and that all of that is the entire overarching process can I, can I say, uh, can I say, you know, what kind of makes a state a state is its ability to coerce. You know, it's it's like a socioeconomic discipline, and what keeps that that um, coercion from wearing down, that physical coercion from wearing down, is like you know hegemony, being able to keep people from trying to wear it down. You know, by you know, it's practical to use, like I guess, psyop would be the word to use to keep people from away from wearing down that coercion. Uh, and, you know, with this, you know, in capitalism, capitalist ownership, and this kind of goes back to surplus value, is is, is it doesn't have a, a productive place. All it has is a political place. It's only a state policy that keeps it here. And so it's that's why capitalists are constantly uh, having to push political measures to maintain their state. That's why you would see, you know, liberals be like, no, or the Democrat Party be like, no, we don't need to defund the police. You know, uh, we just need to get rid of Trump because that's. That's that's what their their financial support, you know, they don't need their police going away because then they can lose their political hegemony. And with this being said, this is this is how imperialism kind of forms is, is that uh, or at least like colonialism and expansionism. Oh, we lost you. That, uh, that coercion relies on things like military and prisons, you know. And so that's like the private military industrial complex. Oh, am I am I out? Am I, am I still there? You're, you're, Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. My back. Okay. Thanks. 
is, is privately owned. And so they're, you know, in one, um, the, uh, so to be at the, the, you know, if their whole um, <laughs> capitalist mode of production is to constantly create war so that they can send out, you know, their, um, so that they can, you know, regain profit. They do that with lobbying the state out. And that's what surplus value goes to. This is, you know, the, the working class has no interest in expanding state territory. It doesn't, the proletariat has no interest in forcing socialism on another country. Like the capitalist what? forcing capitalism on another country. Because like smoke a cigar. The proletarian has no interest in forcing socialism on another country? Well, then why are you trying to force it on people in this? Like, like, why can't you guys just create your... Autumn, why can't you guys just create your own little socialist state? Like, within the United States? Why can't you guys just take over Vermont and leave the rest of us alone? And on the production value of everybody here in Canada and in, you know, Asia and Africa. Whereas a worker, you know, if they say they only own a field, if they go own land in another place, they can't go work that land. You know, that would be impractical. And so this is kind of what the... This is kind of why empires exist and why colonialism exists. Is that there, there's a uh, oh, you cut there's out a, again. Uh, uh, capitalist. A, a class interest among that strictly political. Okay, I, I was just gonna say, like, uh, colonialism itself is a political dominance over material resources, and it does this by any way that facilitates this. And uh, like Nazis are crossing their border, right? And then, you know, that's why you don't see China actually like drone striking people so that they can carry out, uh, you know, certain deals is because there's no class interest in the proletariat to do such things. Whereas here it's like, oh, we have political opposition to us taking the resources. We have to remove that political opposition. And that's what this deadweight capitalist ownership actually provides to society is imperialism, is an expansion of resources or expansion of political domination over the world precisely brother well said and this is just more evidence that our forces of production have outmoded the relations of production that the reason all of us are here together is because that's happening and it's forcing us into motion it's creating the impetus for us to make the decisions to be here, to figure this out so that we can fight. Not because we want to, but because we need to. Uh, very well said. Let's. With that being said, though, let's move on to Section 8, which I believe is the last section. Um, yeah. And actually, we don't even really need to uh, go into 8 for the whole thing. We will, though. Everything, all of the sort of... Uh, Theoretical work is in the first seven. Part eight is sort of a bonus, really. Uh, it's a great bonus, but uh, just that being said, does anyone have any questions before we move on to that on the role of the state, though? Well, I, I just I, I observed something, and it just reminded me of something in section seven. Uh, what he says to Hunt, the Communist Manifesto says the executive of the modern state is but a committee for managing the common affairs of the whole bourgeoisie. That reminds me of a meme that I saw. Of course, it always goes back to a meme, but the meme I saw was basically of a pyramid. And at the top of the pyramid was uh, you have, of course, the king on one side of the pyramid as far as in feudalism. But on the opposite side, you have the, the central bank the, the central bankers and then you have you know lower than them then you have like the lords and then you have the the big banks and things like that but right in the middle of that pyramid was actually the 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 class of people who run the nation and they are basically the they're basically the middle managers of the nation that oversee the the system that benefits the bourgeoisie and so when now as i look at it whenever i look at somebody that's running for president of the country they're actually competing to be the middle managers in order to benefit the ruling class 
And so this is why I'm now looking at the political system and I'm like, what value is it in electoral politics in the first place? Like, is there any type of value in it at all? Well, I mean, that's a you know, fair question, beyond, but, but becoming know, a communist uh, is not the outside answer. Outside of a socialist revolution. That's what it just comes to mind. He, like, he's that. going right yeah, down the anarchist really, track. Uh, like, well said, brother. It's this is this is where these people really piss me off because it's like they're going right down the anarchism track. They're like government is worthless, politics is worthless. Guy, I'm like, yes, yes. They're like government always screws things up. I'm like, yes, that's correct. Going in the right direction, and they're like, then the answer is to become a socialist. Like, no, no, we've detoured. We made a wrong turn. We were like on our way there, and then all of a sudden, you hung a massive U-turn out of fucking nowhere. No, no. Um, I like the meme, and by the way, memes can be great agitation, right? Uh, but it really puts into a uh, light the fact that the state serves a particular class's interest, and that you're right, they are the sort of the middle managers of capital. It is capital giving them their marching orders, and then they sort of work it out. It's the donors and the lobbyists and the corporations that even write our legislation. Like, let's be very real about that. Um, can, can I say, we used to say, call bro. this like the, there, there's part of it that's like he was the so intelligentsia close, Rod. He was this and far away. The sort of who uh, Lenin finally said that uh, they believe they are the, the brains of the nation when actually they are its flatulence, right? So basically calling them uh, windbags of another kind, right? Um, but yeah, I, I thought I heard someone wanted to say something. Yeah, I was going to say uh, one thing that something to consider that I've considered since the, the U.S. began dumping $100 billion of worth of weapons into uh, Ukraine, you know, what they're what they're doing is they're getting rid of all their old um, design of weaponry that was more designed for like mm. like guerrilla armies in the Middle East. Uh, and now they they know they're going to just get destroyed in Russia, right, because Russia's got a more superior military system. One action I saw that was crucial. And what I began doing was taking agitational pieces that explain dictatorship of the proletariat, explain how, explain the political character of the uh, workers' struggle, you know, um, in terms that the average American could understand. And I particularly went to places where there was a large private military industrial complex, like factory of some sort, like, uh, like either a bomb manufacturing plant or a HIMAR plant. And I, I set them on cars there at night, right? And um, the reason I did that was so that, you know, because at the end of the day, if they want to refill that, no matter how well they design them, no matter how well, if they want to keep doing war, war is about mobilization. It's about action and getting it done. And they completely rely on their proletariat to do that in these factories. They completely rely on even even if it's their engineers. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, brother. Sorry, sorry. I was just gonna say they completely rely on their 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 workers to mobilize their productivity, and uh, by doing this, I was I was the aim. You know, that's something maybe something can do. Somebody can do to slow down the process of the corporations refilling their military coercion and redesigning their new military coercion is systemically reaching the consciousness of the proletariat in the private military industrial complex. Um, if you know places where there's like Lockheed Martin plants. Um, you know, right down, you, you know, just U.S. munition commands, factories, any places like that, you could reach their consciousness and explain, um, you know, the real power of their work. Because while you see these Lockheed Martin sponsored think tanks going around saying like, oh, we need to take on this moral crusade against China and Russia. The people in these factories are going, if this war starts, we're going to get bombed. Like we're going to get we're going to be the first to get killed. You know, they're all fully aware of that. They're fully aware of their value. They realize they that they can't go commit these imperialist crimes without their work. Um, so that's that's if you want to uh, slow down the coercion of the capitalists, that that could be a good place to start if you're near there by systemically explaining, uh, you know, the dictatorship of the proletariat to uh, e even other people in that community because they will interact with the people in those factories. Usually, those factories make up a large part of the economy and the workforce there, wherever they're at. <clears throat> yeah, they, uh, they can keep them they from refilling up... quickly. Mm -hmm. They make up most of the USA's remaining productive capital, 
which that's a little bit beyond where we're at in this class, but that's a really important thing. Uh, I see someone over there has their hand up. I'm I'm on the the uh, streaming window at the moment, so I can't read it. I have terrible eyesight. Um, oh, it's it's me. I can put my hand on now. Um, yeah, I've worked with uh with with Mark Saul over the last year on that campaign with the info on the cards and stuff, and it's it's been very productive. Um, I, I had an idea, and I don't know if I should uh like uh, like uh put a pin in this until after the the class and ask you, but it was uh, it was surrounding the idea of um, how to get uh, a, a essentially a mass line, a survey um, for unions uh, to be able to know where you're at in your area. Um, and I don't know if you want me to go after class and talk about that or to do it now. Yeah, that might, that, let's maybe wait till we're done with this. I think uh, that's a really important thing though. The, the Midwestern Marx Institute uh, hopefully we can, we're trying to in the future develop uh, ways of creating polling and getting focus group data and things like that to really feel the pulse of the working people in this country uh, because you need that in the U.S. And doing that through the internet, through our new technology is massive. Uh, but right now let's go into part eight, which is the class struggle strategy and tactics of the working class. Uh, does anyone want to read while I go out? I, By the way, guys, thank you for putting up with me, moving in and out. I have like sort of a, a family emergency happening at the same time as this going on tonight. So I need to keep taking care of stuff. But I really appreciate your patience with me. Thank you. I just want to say that. Thank you. I can read for you. Awesome. Take it away, brother. And thank you, Noah. Thanks for dealing with all the stuff and teaching us, too. <laughs> I am happy to. Thank you. <laughs> awesome. <clears throat> all right. Uh, everyone ready? Cool. All right. Section eight, the class struggle strategy and tactics of the working class. Marx and Engels not only worked out the general principles, but also the fighting methods of the proletariat. In their various books, and especially in their voluminous correspondence, are to be found the basic answers to most of the scores of complex questions of strategies and tactics, which for the past century have been serious problems for the developing labor movement. I want everyone to pay. I know we've been doing this for a while. I know that we've got uh, less than half an hour. We are in the home stretch, guys. I understand this is like a long ass stream tonight, and I'm sorry for that, but this is just the way it goes. I want everyone to pay attention, though, because they're talking about how they're going to like the fighting tactics of the proletariat. And this is like an important thing that we should know about and appropriate whenever possible. Most of labor's later weaknesses on these questions have been due to failure or refusal to learn the lessons of Marx's writings. Inasmuch as we shall see in passing how the three successive international organizations of the working class have dealt with various of these questions, here we can do hardly more than to list a few of them. Um, I'll just do the next parody. Uh, Marx and Engels realized very clearly that the working class fighting against ruling classes that would use every form of violence to retain their class power would have to be prepared themselves to meet force with force. Marx said, quote, force is the midwife of every society pregnant with a new one. I love it, so I'm gonna just read it again. Marx said, force is the midwife of every society pregnant with a new one. Only in Great Britain, and the United States did he, under the circumstances of that time, which as Lenin later showed, was before the rise of imperialism, consider bourgeois democracy advanced enough to raise the possibility of a peaceful transition by the workers to socialism. All right, stop right there, I'm coming back in. <laughs> oh, there's a ghost. Yeah, yeah, uh, sorry, sorry about that, I'm back. Um, I, I wanna point out here, Oh no, he froze. Oh no. Oh, you cut out, Noah.
Oh, muted. That's a shame. That's a shame. No, you're muted. No, it's doing a whole inner monologue right now. You're still muted. I can hear you. You're good. I can hear you. Yeah. Yes. Come on, Noah. We believe in you, Noah. We Noah, believe in muted. you. We believe in you. For the stream, you're muted. Okay, how about now? Am I good now, brother? Yes. Okay. So, um... Marx, okay, to start over, we are always asked about the question of violence. We are revolutionaries after all. And when people think about revolution, <laughs> they think Spin. about a violent overthrow <laughs> of one thing for another. Now, there's two uses of this word. Uh, revolution, in a scientific sense, is the transition of one thing into another thing, right? It is the full revolution turning around of a thing. It actually comes from the Copernican revolution in science and uh, the study of space and planets, etc. Now, politically, this is a full change from the old system to the new. And what Marx is saying here is that uh, force has always been the means by which the new system comes into being because the old system reacts violently to defend itself and its class interests. He notes, however, that in Britain and the USA, this might not be the case, that nice they path. may accomplish Thanks a new way. By. Now, when we get to Lenin, Lenin explains how that possibility went away with imperialism. But it raises the question, it is always a possibility, right? Um, in a new era, could there be a peaceful transition? Possibly. Uh, could there not be? Possibly. But as communists, we never advocate adventurism. We never advocate violence. When violence comes for us, when a fight comes to us, we are ready for it. I don't ever throw the first punch. I don't start a fight, but I will goddamn well finish one. And that is sort of the encapsulation of the proletariat. That's basically... The problem is, how does he define starting a fight? Because remember, these people believe that words are violence. So how does he exactly define starting a fight? Fish Addict, I understand exactly what you mean. I, I I truly understand. Fish Addict says, watching these streams by Carlin has been very bad for my social life. These issues are so everyday to me, but when I bring up these ideas among friends, they have no idea what I'm talking about. Because you speak socialist, and they don't. And you can see things that they can't see. But I understand. I really do understand. Me embodying the ideology of our class right so i just wanted to be clear on violence that's a very uh touchy issue sometimes and a lot of times it's hard to know how to talk to people about it but if we use sort of our common sense that violence is really uh ethically weird to a lot of people but when we think about it in, in a defensive sense it is always okay, and that's how generally communists have acted. The Bolsheviks didn't go in and start murdering people. They defended themselves as the reactionaries, the czarists, etc. Really? Uh, really? The Bolsheviks didn't go in murdering people? Isn't that 
precisely what the Bolsheviks did? Didn't didn't the Bolsheviks murder the the whole family of the Tsar, like to include children? Didn't didn't the Bolsheviks explicitly murder people? Began fighting to hold on to power after they had outlived uh, that. It, it's a whole thing we can go over history at some point, and we're going to have history classes eventually. But just to give you guys a, a, a round view of the subject. I have a quick question. Um, Does anyone have any questions mm-hmm. about it, or do you want to kind of keep going? Yeah, I have a quick question. Um, in terms of when you were talking about violence. Um, All right, let's keep going. Just have... uh, keep reading. Go for it. He didn't hear. <laughs> uh, looks like we had someone speaking, but. I don't know. Noah, can you hear us? Oh, you're muted, I think. Oh, um, can you, can you guys hear you me? Can you hear you. Can you hear okay. We just can't hear him. Okay, does Matt, someone else want to read that? Noah can't hear. Matt, can you hear technology me? Again. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. So, Noah, it looks like the issue's on your end, but uh, my friend... see if everyone could hear me read it is it just me that i can't hear you guys did something mess up when my mic came unplugged could be do me a favor kyle say something for me check check oh yeah i can't hear anything lovely (laughs) gotta love this technology right oh all right how about this uh we're on our bonus section now so why don't I just read through it and we'll go from there because, and then after that, uh, I'll come back in and we'll just talk just the class and me when the stream is done. Does that sound good to you guys? All right. Awesome. Now I don't remember exactly where we were, uh, but it is the third paragraph. Of I will. The section. I'm trying. Oh, here we go. Oh, you can't hear me. Marx and Engels, while realizing the necessity of the working class and making temporary alliances with other classes with whom its interests coincided at the time, uh, remember the pe- worker peasant alliance, for example, or parentheses, even with the bourgeoisie in the struggle against feudalism or against an imperialist invader, uh, laid the greatest stress upon the fundamental necessity of the workers having their own distinct class organizations and policies. That means the right opportunist line that the Democrats are somehow harm reduction is not a Marxist line, right? Uh, Because of the class character of the proletariat and what its interests represent, it needs its own political organizations We can't just run around saying these bourgeoisie are good enough. They are not. These bourgeoisie exploit and oppress just like the rest of them. Uh, Anyway, um, a basic lesson in which the labor movements in many countries, notably the United States, have by no means fully learned yet. Uh, Another problem that has plagued the labor movement for a century is how to establish the correct relationship between the struggle for the workers' immediate demands and the struggle for the establishment of socialism. But Marx, in the Communist Manifesto, gave a clear line for this in his basic statement, that the communists fight for the attainment of the immediate aims for the enforcement of the momentary interests of the working class. But in the movement of the present, they also represent and take care of the future of that movement which means we don't sell out the entire thing for a temporary concession. We don't uh, pick either long-term or short-term. There is a way to struggle that includes both. There always is, as proved by the successful revolutions in history, right? Marx understood very well, although in his writings he did not develop it at great length, the vital question of the role of the peasantry 
as potential allies of the revolutionary working class. And this is important to uh, hear because a lot of people uh, believe this sort of uh, narrative that Marx got this wrong somehow, that he didn't understand the revolutionary possibility of the peasantry, but that's not the case, right? Uh, it often goes sort of, oh, Marx believed revolution would break out first in the most developed countries rather than the third world. But he actually speaks of these less developed countries in the peasantry, and he's uh, Foster's about to mention uh, an instance of this now, saying, uh, illustrating his understanding of this matter, Marx, referring to the revolution of 1848, that he took part in, by the way, said, the whole thing in Germany will depend on the possibility of covering the rear of the proletarian revolution by some second edition of the peasant war. One of the basic causes for the eventual failure of the Second International was precisely its inability to grasp this elementary proposition, the basis of which was worked out by Marx. Now, it got published after Foster had died, but uh, letters came out where Marx was in correspondence with Russian revolutionaries uh, talking about the revolutionary potential of the Russian peasantry because of the social consciousness it develops within its peasant communes. Uh, and that's really important to this too. Marx and Engels also worked out many other basic questions of strategy and tactics. They evaluated the roles in the class struggle of the trade unions and of the cooperative movement. They established a proletarian policy towards war and established the role of the general strike in the fight against militarism. And if you want some extra reading on this that is absolutely brilliant and innovative, uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, the father of American Marxism, has a section in his sort of <gasps> magnum opus called... Guys, Viva Robin D'Angelo has his fifis all in a bunch all over Twitter. Viva Robin D'Angelo is having all sorts of feelings all over Twitter <laughs> about the fact that I roasted his ass last night for being so wrong on Project Veritas. Viva, we're going to deal with... Viva, I have been teaching people about socialism for the past four hours while you have been having feelings all over Twitter about how fucking wrong you were and are and will continue to be so i need to wrap up the socialism class now viva but don't don't you worry honey this is not remotely over i've got a clip already waiting <laughs> all right guys sorry 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 i know i just busted in <laughs> Like, they really had to... Di I'm actually really impressed. I have to say, I have... Okay, let me, let me read. <laughs> hang on, hang on, hang on. Oh, hang on, hang on. All right, you guys want to see what he did? You guys want to see? So, you know what? Fuck it. We've got like 13 minutes of this class left. Can we call it a day with the socialism? I just, I, I can't, I can't. I'm not even paying attention anymore. Let's, let's, let me take this down real quick and I will give you guys, thank you for hanging in. Well, we'll go to, uh, we'll go to the Twitters for... Viva Robin D'Angelo. Let's see. I know, I know. We we really hung in as long as we could. Viva Robin D'Angelo. Here it is. 
if anyone had any doubts as to whether Carlin is uninformed or unintelligent or a combination of both, this should eliminate all doubt. Carlin, I didn't edit anything off YouTube. You're just unprepped and ill-informed. Or a liar. So Viva is having feelings about the fact that I caught him editing his stream. And, and he basically took out the clip. And I know you did, Viva, because I watched the full stream earlier in the day. And then when we got to it, it was somehow missing. And so I had to go find it on a whole other account. That's what you got your fee-fees in, in a bunch about disagree with me all you want but don't lie you might want to think about apologizing no viva d'angelo i will never apologize to you do you know who you owe an apology to viva you owe an apology to everyone at project veritas the actual undercover reporters not james o'keefe the actual people who are doing the actual undercover reporting that you and every other conservative influencer have been shitting on for the past couple of days. Oh, James O'Keefe does everything. James O'Keefe is amazing. James O'Keefe does nothing wrong. And it's all those little people that are just trying to throw him under the bus. No, bro. No, no, no. You are the one that owes an apology, Viva. And when this entire trial play plays out, and you realize how retarded you acted in this entire circumstance. That's when we're going to really see Viva, who's uninformed and unintelligent and a liar and a shill and someone who pretends to have intellectual integrity, but has no idea what he's talking about at all. Because he didn't bother to do basic journalism. So you can whine and cry about, Carlin was a big meanie and, and she lied about me clipping my stream. Which she didn't lie about you clipping the stream because I watched it earlier in the day. And then when we went back last night, it was mysteriously changed. Mysteriously. Now... It's okay, Viva, to want to cover your tracks. It's okay to want to pretend that you didn't say things that you did, in fact, say. Don't worry, Viva. I went and I got the clip elsewhere. Don't worry. But time is going to tell on this one, my friend. And I also find it really interesting that Viva is got his, his, his Florida panties in a bunch. All about... The fact that I said that he edited his stream, which he did. But that's not even the most important part, Viva. That's not even the most interesting part. That's not even the most relevant part, Viva Robin D'Angelo. Because everything that I basically took you to task for after we discovered that you edited your stream which really wasn't even that big of a thing. Those are all significantly more important. So why don't you try watching the rest of the stream, Viva? Did he say anything else? She shit talks me and lies and she blocks me. Viva, I blocked you like months ago, bro. I blocked you months ago months ago. You want to know why? Because I have no desire to be associated with people like you that have absolutely zero intellectual integrity at all. People that would throw the average working people at Project Veritas, the undercover reporters that are actually going out and getting the stories that James O'Keefe takes credit for. I blocked you after the Eliza Blue thing, Viva, I blocked you a long ass time ago. And because I don't actually consider you to be that relevant or interesting, I just didn't talk about it. I didn't announce my departure. Because you and whatever the fuck you're doing plays no part in what I am trying to do, which was today spending four hours teaching people about socialism. Holy cow dishonesty knows no bounds viva 
listen, bro, listen. You're obsessed with Twitter, Viva. You have somehow convinced yourself that Twitter is real life. You have somehow convinced yourself that Twitter followers mean anything in the real world. You have somehow convinced yourself that me blocking you on Twitter, which I did months ago without announcing my departure because I'm a fully grown adult, Viva, you have somehow convinced yourself that this whole world is all that matters. But real life actually matters, Viva. And your buddy James is going to get his ass sued and handed to him in court. And when he does, you are going to look like a moron for that take you had the other night where you basically claimed that Project Veritas had fired James O'Keefe because of Canadian law. How is it, Viva, that I, as an industrial organizational psychologist, know more about this than you do, the alleged lawyer? So seethe and cope, Viva D'Angelo. Seethe and cope. There are more clips coming, and you damn well should know it. And you really should have watched the whole clip, not just the part where I said you edited your stream, which you obviously, obviously, obviously clearly did, which was the least important part of your horrible, despicable, underhanded, ridiculous influencer take on a situation where you're pretending to be a lawyer and do a legal analysis. We're going to see how this plays out, buddy. We'll see. Cry harder. (laughs) That felt good. That was like, that was like getting the blood flowing after four hours of socialism. And we are broadcasting on Twitter right now, which is the only thing apparently that Viva D'Angelo cares about. All right, guys. <sighs> See, I didn't get that fiery for the socialism stream tonight. I don't know what it was. Maybe Midwestern Marks just put me to sleep for a little while. Maybe, maybe I'm just like, I'm feeling exhausted from socialism. I don't know what it was. But thank you guys for allowing me to um, work out some feelings there. I really do appreciate it. But guys, that's gonna, we're gonna wrap it up now. I don't need to be on the internet any longer. Um, (laughs) I definitely don't need to be on the internet any longer. Um, Did I have two beers? No, I had like a beer and like a couple of sips of this beer. This beer is good. This is the pastry sour beer with uh, raspberries and blackberries. Can you seriously believe that Viva D'Angelo is this unhinged over the fact that I pointed out that he edited his stream? Like, am I wrong to say that that's a... Viva, I promise you, I said way worse things about you on the whole stream. (laughs) I said... (laughs) Viva, when you find out how badly I spanked your ass on that stream, the fact that that I correctly pointed out that you edited your YouTube stream is going to pale in comparison for some of the things that I said about you on that stream. I I promise you, bro. I promise you. And if you want to start a little feud with me over this because your fee-fees are in a bunch, you can feel more than welcome to. And I will continue to spank your ass over and over and over and over and over again, all the way up till the Project Veritas James O'Keefe trial. And we'll see who comes out on top, Viva. I feel really comfortable in my position. I also feel really comfortable with the fact that you have not properly investigated or researched this situation at all. And you're going to get your ass spanked by the lying, uninformed, unintelligent woman who dared to block you on Twitter so you couldn't do anything about it. (laughs) God, I hate influencers. I hate them so much. Hate, pity, I don't know. Yeah, that or he's outright lying. 
All right, guys, I'm going to wrap it up now. I think that's enough socialism for one night. I screwed up my knitting 17 times, and, uh, and now Viva Robin D'Angelo is complaining on Twitter, and it is what it is. I'm just surprised you didn't come out and say you brought up valid points. Prob <laughs> Probably because he's not smart enough to understand that. Well, we're wrapping up. We're wrapping up, Brooklyn. I was just, uh, I was just giving Viva Robin D'Angelo a piece of my mind for being a little bitch on the internet that he is. All right, guys, I am, I am heading out. I'm probably gonna make a clip of this and put it on Twitter, just because we know that's the only place that Viva Robin D'Angelo actually responds to. I may even unblock him, just for funsies. Take care, guys. Have a good one. We'll see you soon.